Madam Acting yes. Speaker, I move that private member's business notice of motion number six be now taken. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Madam Acting Speaker. Yes, Member for North West Central. Uh, I uh, move that this House condemns the Labor government for its failure to prioritise housing in the last five years of government, creating a housing crisis the state has never seen before, triggering significant economic and social consequences. Now, that's the motion that the opposition has uh, moved uh, today. When you have a look at, there is 17 or over 17,000 struggling families uh, who are looking, queuing for government housing. There have been 1,300 houses owned by the government, sold by the government. Who knows how much that's probably been worth to the government, but I would say in the order of three or $350 million in their back pocket from the sale of social housing, housing that is desperately needed uh, by the people in Western Australia, the people who need it most, those who are struggling, struggling individuals and struggling families, over 17,000 of them that this government has neglected. But when you have a look at the empty houses that exist, government housing, that is empty. We know that over a thousand government houses remain empty. One thousand government houses remain empty. We know that over three, 1,300 have been sold. We know that there are 17,000 struggling families out there who are looking for housing, and we have the government selling off its stock selling off its stock and, and, more importantly, who have got empty houses scattered right across uh, this, um, this state. And when you have a look at the, the history of this government from 2017, we've seen, we've seen a, uh, uh, a decrease. Uh, so in 2017 18, the government sold 269 homes uh, in 1819. Uh, sorry, that's 2017 uh, 18, the government sold 269 homes, uh, 234 in 1819, 196 in 1920, and another 138 in 2021, and the list goes on. It sold 534 three bedroom homes, 84. 82, uh, 82 four-bedroom homes, 123 two-bedroom homes, and 44 one-bedroom homes. Um, so, uh, members, when you have a look at this government's track record, you got a got a question. The, uh, we talk about the health crisis, but I think uh, what's contributing to the health crisis is the housing crisis, and I'll go more why the two are, are connected. Um, but when in question time today, when I asked the Minister for Housing um, in reference to whether or not he attended the Housing Solutions Summit, summit held on the 29th of July, uh, convened by Shelter WA, attended by peak housing industry representatives and community group organisations, and I asked, was the Minister invited? And I think he said, yes, he was invited. Did you or your, any of your ministerial colleagues attend the Housing Summit Solution? And he wasn't on a venture. He was on an adventure. Where was he? In Kalgoorlie. In Kalgoorlie. When there was a housing summit to talk about the housing crisis, where was the housing minister? I know where he was. He was perched up at the Palace Hotel uh, sipping his Bloody Mary. That's what he was doing. While there was a housing crisis meeting to try and work out how we can come up with solutions to the housing crisis this state has got, coupled up with, with the health crisis, the people of Western Australia, the most vulnerable people of Western Australians uh, uh, are suffering. So the Minister for Housing, I just want to get this on record, did not attend the summit the Housing uh, Solutions Summit held on the 29th of July, convened by housing uh, industry leaders, uh, social housing industry leaders, uh, because he was away in a love-in in Kalgoorlie with the rest of the Labor Party cronies. That's it. Not, That's not, it. 
and not tackling the serious issues of the housing crisis which this state uh, has got and has had because of the lack of investment, no investment, the huge waiting lists, the selling off of uh, houses, uh, the empty houses that exist. Who is in charge of housing in this state? That is the question. Who is in charge of housing in this state? Now, it's not all your fault, current Minister for Housing. We've had uh, a housing minister before. Um, he got removed, and, and rightfully so, because the, the lack of action in the housing space clearly over the last uh, four and a half years has now led to this catastrophic set of circumstances where people where people of Western Australia are struggling uh, to be able to get into any social housing because of the actions and lack of actions uh, that this Labor government has taken in terms of uh, housing in this state. Uh, members, I want to indulge you with uh, some of the headlines that have been nearly day in, day out, week in, week out, every month over the last four and a half years, uh, we have seen people um, and a report after report about the crisis when it comes to housing in the state. And only, I think only now we're starting to see the state Labor government act on the pressure that uh, the opposition and the media and the public have put on the Minister for Health having to be backed in the corner to, uh, to announce extra funding and now starting to talk about the health crisis uh, that we've got in this state, hence why we have, uh, they've had to put more money. And there's no detail around that money or when that money is going to be spent, uh, but it's a start of the government acknowledging that there's a health crisis. We now need to do the same with the Minister for Health and this Labor, state Labor government to get the Minister for Housing to be able to acknowledge that there is a housing crisis in this state. And uh, the Minister uh, referred to some of the, the, the uh, quotes today by the uh, Shelter WA uh, CEO in regards to uh, housing and uh, um, wanted to bring me as a local member uh, into the debate in regards to building single bed units uh, uh, in um, Carnarvon and do I support that? And I think the Minister for Housing actually misses the point where it's the, fus the frustration has been built up and that the desperation is there uh, that people are trying to look for large parcels of land that can be developed to try and curb the housing crisis. Do I support housing being built in Carnarvon? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do I support single bed uh, housing, 100 of them in, in an, uh, an old school uh, site? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So for the Minister to suggest that uh, uh, he's trying to make me uh, uh, support or not support housing in Carnarvon, we've got a lack of housing. And I'll, I'll go into the needs of my electorate and needs of the Gascoigne and, and Greater Regional WA. Um, so when you have a look at uh, uh, the... Um, the articles over time, and I'll read a few out. Uh, opinion by Shelter WA CEO Kieran Wong. Uh, the West, 9th of the 8th, 2021. Figures last month showed at least 56 people died while homeless in Perth in 2020. 56 people. In the past year, lost six times as many people to homelessness. More than 50,000 renters consider their housing unaffordable. And and what I, uh, or, uh, one of the distressing parts about um, uh, the situation that we're, we're in, not only have we got tens of thousands of people in waiting lists, government sold 1,300 houses, um, there's uh, over 1,000 empty houses, there's also, oh, uh, you know, um, SHERP, which is the uh, renovation of uh, houses, that's three to four years away. But reports of sex for rent schemes skyrocket reports of sex schemes uh, reports of sex for rent schemes skyrocket 
Minister, if, if, having headlines like that or comments like that is just showing uh, the desperate situation that people in West Australia are. It's not all beer and skittles. When we hear about the, uh, when the when the Premier gets up and talks about our economy, he's failing to address the, the community needs, the social needs, the housing needs, the health needs. Uh, don't get confused that our economy is going well, well because uh, of the resource sector, particularly iron ore. That is keeping us well and truly afloat and doing well. But when it comes to our housing sector, our health sector, our small business, it's not all beer and skittles. There is pressures, there is concerns. And when you have headlines, reports of sex for rent schemes skyrocket, that should be alarm bells. The fact that there is a housing crisis and that's what people are having to resort to. Outrageous. I'll go on. One in five people have ranked it as their number one issue uh, when it comes to housing. And, and um, I'm glad that the Minister for Police has piped up because part of the issue when it comes to uh, lack of housing and no housing in regional WA for his own police force members to take up, no housing. So even if we want to increase the amount of police uh, in regional WA, you can't because there's no housing. So it's affecting your portfolio. And how about you find a voice within Cabinet and do what's right for your members and stand up for them and get some houses built. If not, be quiet and, and be vocal when it comes to being in Cabinet. But members, members, here we've got the peanut gallery. The peanut gallery is still here. The peanut gallery who are failing to address. Say no, they don't. They get told what to do in Cabinet. But, oh my God. Keep going. And you know what? They're funny. They say the same thing about you. They say the same thing about you. Um, members, um, this is... Excuse me, Member. Can you please direct your question through the Chair? Other members, please refrain from interjecting. What you know is when you're hurting the, the uh, members opposite, the Labor government, they resort to personal attacks all the time. Personal attacks, attacking the individual. Uh, the member for Armidale, he knows what that's like. He's been on the other side as well. He's been on the other side as well. Uh, but members, we know how the, the la arrogant Labor government acts towards m the members of opposition who are here representing their constituency and who are here are the only ones trying to make sure that the Labor government is held to account on very important issues such as the housing crisis that we face, that we face. And members, and members for Coburn, if you think that you don't have a housing crisis, do you have a housing crisis in your electorate? Do you have a housing crisis? Member for Coburn, do you have... Me members, can you please have some respect for Hansa? We cannot hear what is going on. Do you have a in your electorate? Uh, I'll say it again. Ah, a, a, a say silence. Can't answer it, but has to now learn how to personally attack those opposite. Those opposite. It just shows you, shows you, shows you the level of depth that you've got. Shows you the level of depth. And the police minister, media police minister. Member for, Minister for Police. Thank you. Anyway, let's continue on. Like I said, Excuse news me, article members. after news article. Uh, when you have a look at... Um... It's a very serious issue, Madam Atkins Speaker. I would, uh, Madam Deputy Atkins Speaker, I would like to be able to hear the member for North West Central. I'm having great difficulty hearing what he's got to say on behalf of his constituents and others that are being impacted uh, in relation to this matter. Member for North West Central, can you please direct your question through the chair? So, Other members, please stop interjecting. So, Madam Acting Speaker, as I, there's a news report, ABC News, 8th of the 8th, 2021, dropping service for a service for homeless people in Midland, forced to turn away 6,000 families and 500 young people in the past year. Um, and that's since the moratoriums lifted. Uh, people needed uh, in, needing increased um, help, uh, and it's not slowing down needs more affordable housing, more funding to expand their services, families and single mothers in the, grow, uh, in the growing up group um, 
uh, who go to Midland, they feel unsafe in the CBD. Uh, City of Swans want to see homeless uh, people given a seat at the table. And it goes on. News article ABC 6 of the 8th 2021. Uh, Geraldton Youth Homeless Service has recorded its highest level of demand in 10 years. Turnaround is slow because there's no tendencies to send young people to. Uh, South West Times, 5th of the 8th, 2021, 13 people sleeping in Tent City um, at, uh, at uh, the Graham uh, Bricknell Music Shell in Bunbury. Housing First relies on uh, placing people in housing, giving them wraparound support, but there is a lack of housing stock. Um, uh, and it goes on, oh, Perth Now, Central, uh, 5th of the 8th, 2021, uh, philanthropic housing developer given the green light to build uh, temporary homes by government um, loaned land in Vic Bar. Temporary homes, building temporary homes. Does, does it say crisis? What does? Um, uh, and you've got the activeness, uh, obviously, Shelter WA, who's very active, trying to find pieces of land, throwing up suggestions because they are desperate. Um, and you've even got uh, the Perth Lords Mayor, uh, Basil uh, uh, Zemplis, taking upon himself as Lord Mayor of Perth to try and deal with um, the homeless situation, the crisis gripping our, uh, our um, pride and joy, that is uh, Perth City. Perth City is taking it on himself to come up uh, with, um, uh, with solutions and putting money where his mouth is and putting, I think, uh, $3.7 million uh, towards uh, dealing, on, uh, dealing with uh, those uh, who need a shelter, 3.7 of ratepayers' money from the City of Perth. Uh, and uh, where, is, where is the state government? You've got the local government leading the way when it comes to the City of Perth. And uh, well done to uh, uh, Basil Zemplis, the Mayor of the City of Perth, taking it upon himself to try and fix uh, these issues that are plaguing, shouldn't have plaguing, to. Shouldn't, have to. shouldn't have to, but plaguing our, our, our city. Uh, Midwest Times, 7,421 uh, 20 square metres government-owned land listed for Sun Cumbie. Carnarvon could be accommodated for 151 bed bedroom units, something the minister has criticised, but I think misses the point of what Shelter of WA are trying to find. That is, land that's available to be able to deal with the crisis facing uh, uh, people in this state, and particularly regional uh, regional WA. So instead of criticising, instead of not showing up um, to uh, their forums that they're holding because of the arrogancy of uh, the housing uh, minister and this government, you should be working with uh, Shelter WA to come up with solutions, workable solutions, rather than criticising and bullying these organisations. One of these things that's coming out from all these uh, uh, non-for-profit groups, uh, groups right around Western Australia, who are fearful of speaking out against the Labor government, fearful of speaking out against the Labor, Labor government because of the fear of the government cutting off their funding, the fear of not having a seat at the table um, uh, when the government holds a for forum. This is what's growing, members. Members of this House, shameful acts of arrogancy, bullying by the Labor government when it comes to organisations. And today's question time, talking about um, the forum which the, uh, the Minister for Housing snubbed, and then criticised Shelter WA from coming up with a potential solution to the problem. Potential solution to the problem. Um, uh, so it keeps going on. We, we, we talk about the uh, uh, Bestie uh, Buchanan. Um, the West says housing crisis is WA's emergency, and First Nations families are, are the hardest uh, families, first hardest. The death of. And, and, the, and it goes on. Vulnerable Aboriginal families are losing their children at a rate of more than one a week due to the public housing crisis. The overcrowding that's occurring, the housing crisis when it comes to uh, our, our most vulnerable, uh, and we have here um, um, 
and uh, members, perhaps you perhaps you might learn something, or perhaps you want to get a cup of tea. You're normally there eating eating uh, the, the the scone and, and biscuits uh, at the afternoon tea. Uh, member for uh, Wanneroo, but anyway. Um, so uh, when it keeps going on, um, you go to the west. A 14 year old grandson meant to be under DPC care um, was wandering through the streets, and a grandmother, one year grandson, lived out Thank of you, the members. boot and car. Uh, that was the West, th uh, 3rd of the 8th, 2021. Uh, news article, 3rd of the 8th, uh, Housing First Program in Regional WA, hampered by shortage of social housing, $9.4 million program started in Perth and Bunbury in June but, uh, to fund uh, case workers finding su su uh, sustainable housing. And it's all about uh, money that's there trying to find sustainable housing when you've got organisations putting up options uh, and the government um, uh, being very dismissive uh, of, uh, of those options. Um, and um, uh, when you have a look um, uh, at uh, you know article after article, uh, and uh, you can have a look at local articles, and I'll give you uh, one that in the Midwest uh, times, um, uh, public housing properties sit empty in Geraldton as wait list grows. Um, this uh, was on the 20th of July 2021. Um, uh, a non-for-profit social group in regional Western Australia says the state government's plan to boost social and public housing supply will do little to tackle homeless in the regions. More than 950 people in the Midwest and Gascoigne are on public housing wait lists, and with the average wait time of 94 weeks, nearly two years. Meanwhile, uh, more than 130 properties sit vacant in Geraldton alone, include 39 which are under review and may be refurbished or demolished. Um, and when the minister said there's not when it, in relation to Shelter WA saying that they could use the old Carnarvon High School site uh, for 100 homes, single beds, he said there's no need for 100 beds. Well, it may not be a need in Carnarvon, but when you talk about the Midwest and Gascoigne, including Geraldton, when you've got more than 950 people on the wait list, there is a need for housing. There is a need for housing. And I'll, I, I'll talk about Carnarvon, for example, members. 14 boarded up homes in Carnarvon. 14 boarded up homes in Carnarvon. Now, when you've got a housing crisis, when you've got long uh, uh, wait lists, when you've got the desperate need of people trying to find a home, when you've got overcrowding occurring, which leads to families often being dysfunctional because of the overcrowding, because of the unwelcome visitors that some families have to put up with, leads to uh, the uh, uh, police often often being tied up with some of those antisocial behaviours when it comes to overcrowding. So when you've then got uh, crime issues, when kids don't want to go home because of that overcrowding that's occurring, what do they do? They roam the streets. What do they do? They break into uh, property. So what does that do? It causes the police to be at their wits end and the community, at their community. So when the police go, we need more police officers in Carnarvon, I'll use that as a good example, um, they go, we need nine police. But we've got nowhere to house those police officers. And the police are not the answer to the crime problem or the housing problem, but they're at the pointy end. So when the police go, we need more police officers, and the Minister for Police goes, we're giving Carnarvon an extra five police, I think it originally started off with nine, they can't fulfil, fulfil those places because there's no housing for the police. And so the circle continues. The circle continues where you have the overcrowding problems due to not having uh, um, enough uh, housing stock or adequate housing stock when you've got 14 boarded up homes, uh, when then you've got uh, 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 government employees such as the police need to increase their presence can't because there is no government um, uh, housing. So grow housing is another issue when it comes to government employees. So in regional towns like the Gascoigne can't fulfil any of their complement 
if they've got um, FTEs available to them because there is no housing. No housing when it comes to grow housing, no housing when it comes to social housing. Uh, and so therefore, what you start to see is the homeless uh, increase in regional towns. What you see is uh, the uh, family dysfunction occur because of uh, the uh, uh, overcrowding that's occurring. You start to then see uh, issues when it comes to domestic violence. And then you start to see kids not wanting to go home and roam in the streets who are bored, uh, who are uh, trying to keep themselves occupied to get food uh, or, or to get a drink and, and break into uh, businesses and homes to try and get a feed or to try and get some money um, because they don't want to go home. That's what transpires when you've got a housing crisis, Minister for Housing. That's what transpires. The circle of issues that come from housing, uh, which is the number one driver of uh, uh, antisocial behaviour, the number one driver of issues when it comes to families and homes, and the number one driver when it comes to uh, people in regional towns leaving uh, because the rents start to go through the roof. And, and the inability to get any social housing whatsoever because there has not been any social houses being built uh, in the Gascoigne over the last five years. Over the last five years. Not one. So, Minister for Housing, it is a, it is a crisis that is gripping every part of, of, uh, of the state. Um, and so when you've got the waiting list, when you've got the houses being sold, um, this is the department's uh, response. A department spokesman said of the 141 homes being built across the state under the first stage, eight will be in the Midwest and Gascoigne. And I just want to say Midwest and Gascoigne, I hate the two being merged together because it's Gascoigne separate and the Midwest is separate. Um, and um, uh, when, they talk, when you talk about Midwest, that includes Geraldton, a large regional city, a large regional city. Um, so when you have a look at uh, 141 homes to be built across the first stage under the first stage, eight will be in the Midwest and Gascoigne. This includes two new social housing dwellings, which are managed by community housing providers and six public housing properties maintained by the department. That's all. To deal with the high housing crisis, and, um, and uh, I think there's some quotes here. There's some quotes, oh, I've got, and it's good to see the member for Geraldton uh, in the house, because uh, um, the member for Geraldton, Lara Dalton, said a study last year found 40 to 50 people were sleeping rough, but the true number of people experiencing housing instability was unknown. She promised residents that she'll be pu uh, pushing very hard to get up to 60 Homes West homes uh, uh, presently out of commission open as soon as possible. They're all, they're all, cause they're all boarded up. They're all empty. And um, uh, the, the, the mayor of Geraldton, the mayor of... Oh, I'm glad you brought that up because it's not that clear cut. Because those houses, those houses have have not been adequately done up. They haven't been adequately been given the the. Excuse me, members. So 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 members, you talking about Geraldton? Uh, last week, I can't remember. I think it was Saturday. So uh, actually, I have been passed with the mayor of Geraldton. Well, I, don't, I haven't been. I don't have keys to go in. I'm not part of the government. Uh, perhaps if the minister would like to give me, perhaps the minister would like to give me the keys to those houses. But members, anyway, just to continue on, the member for Geraldton has acknowledged that you have got um, all these uh, houses that have been boarded up, that are empty, that could solve somewhat of the huge waiting list that exists. And that is only in Geraldton, in the Midwest and Gascoigne, which is huge, which is becoming to a point where it's very difficult um, to ever 
ever <laughs> cater for uh, the struggling uh, families and individuals uh, that are facing uh, the Midwest and Gascoigne and the whole of Western Australia. What that does, it moves families away from regional Western Australia. Moves families away because they'll go to, into the city um, where there potentially could be uh, a family member or someone that uh, uh, they may know to be able to put them up for a certain time or a uh, greater chance of getting a house. Uh, so, um, uh, Minister, when it comes to um, housing, social housing, and we've gone through the stats and my colleagues will, will continue to go through the stats, uh, of um, uh, around the state of the lack of housing, the housing crisis that's gripping um, so many people, so many communities. Um, uh, the amount of letters that have been uh, written to to the former minister for housing, um, and um, and I've got one here from um, um, uh, the uh, former Minister of Housing, Honourable Peter Tinley. This is in uh, January 2021, uh, where it's talk, this, this constituent of mine is talking about Exmouth and the, the need for housing in Exmouth. And, um, and uh, he's, uh, this is a response. I appreciate you sharing your observations on the current trends in Exmouth real estate market. It's recognised that housing options in regional centres are at high demand and the smaller markets like Exmouth may find it difficult to respond to uh, significant upturns in demand and this may, uh, may negatively affect the local economy. But as you will be aware, the Department of Communities and Land Development functions are being transferred to Development WA according to the Department of Communities has forwarded your comments and suggestions to Development WA. That's a great response uh, by the former Minister for Housing uh, who had one of my constituents write to him uh, to express the dire need uh, for land to be released so that people can buy uh, build houses. It ended up not being the right traction. No, oh, well, clearly, clearly that's probably the case. Um, but uh, in places like Exmouth, it's actually about land release to be able to get the housing's built, the housing built, and built by the private sector, uh, not so much by uh, uh, by government, and that's where the government has dragged their, their their knuckles on the ground, their feet on the ground, uh, when it comes to land release uh, by development WA on land that has been um, uh, in the in the process. <laughs> Uh, but delayed or hasn't been acted on for the past five years in a town like Exmouth, uh, where the, the uh, department, the government, hasn't put a priority on uh, uh, land release. Land is there, land is available, but uh, haven't been able to settle on native title issues. And obviously, Development WA, a key performance indicator is how much they're going to make off the development. So they'll wait until that price gets to a point gets to a point and then they'll develop uh, the land because in their legislation they have to turn a profit. Um, that's not what's needed in regional uh, well, WA. New, new Minister for Lands as well as Housing. Oh, I'll be interested to see what the Minister for Lands says about uh, particularly the housing uh, uh, situation and the land that needs to be released uh, by Development WA in a town like Exmouth who is really suffering at the moment. Uh, when they've got a general population of 2,500 people, uh, but a visitation rate of 20,000 people uh, in the height of uh, tourism, that puts pressure on small businesses and the alike. Um, and that just leads me into some of the government commitments uh, that were made uh, prior to the election when it comes to workers' accommodation. Workers' accommodation uh, uh, members, and, uh, and I don't know, Member for House, uh, Minister for Housing, if workers' accommodation falls under your remit, but uh, we've got the, the, the Minister for Lands there. I don't know if it falls under your remit, but it's a housing, it's part of the housing crisis. So at the moment, everywhere in Western Australia is, is struggling to get employees. If you can get an employee, there's nowhere to house that employee, particularly in regional WA. And uh, in, at the... Um, just before the 2017, uh, 2021 state election, uh, 
you've got here quotes from uh, the Premier uh, talking about um, workers' accommodation. Land release for Calberry workers' accommodation. If, uh, if re-elected, we will accelerate the process of facilitate and facilitate the construction of new workers' accommodation facility. Um, Mr McGowan said the COVID-19 had significantly impacted the availability of workers' accommodation in Kalbarri, with the shortage continuing uh, to impact tourism, hospitality and small business. The, the initiative came after Northamptonshire President Craig Simpkin said that Kalbarri employees were screaming out for the Shire to find workers' accommodation, uh, to provide workers' accommodation. And it goes on. A commitment. This was a commitment on the 11th of March 2021. 2021, when the Premier waltzed in uh, in his, uh, no, I think it may have been, no, it was, yeah, waltzed in and, um, and announced uh, that they will fast track workers' accommodation. Now, if there was ever a need um, for workers' accommodation, it is now. And that is not only a need for those business operators to have housing for their workers, but a need for Calberry residents to be able to have workers' accommodation for all of the tradies, the builders, to be able to repair their homes, their businesses, uh, from uh, uh, Cyclone Sarosa that hit uh, um, a few months after uh, what occurred um, uh, after the election. So, so members, when you talk about uh, commitments, if a re-elected, if we're re-elected, we'll accelerate the process to facilitate and construct construction of new works accommodation. That is in Calbarry. And uh, what's the date today, members? The eleventh, uh, eleventh of, of August, and we still haven't seen any movement when it comes to workers accommodation uh, for Calbarry. Critical now for the rebuild of Calbarry. Critical for the workers uh, to be able to be housed, to be able to supply that tourism product, that tourism product that West Australians want to be able to uh, uh, receive when they go and visit places like Calgary. That is going to a cafe, being able to get a coffee, get out something to eat, go to a hotel room and check in because the bed sheets have been able to be clean uh, or, or been able to clean a room because there's workers. And the list goes on, members, the list goes on. It is a major issue. Um, but we follow up with the other hot spot in my electorate being Exmouth, um, where uh, state election, this is the Pilbara News, state election, WA Labor reveals plan to fast track solution to stem Exmouth staff housing shortage. Amazing. What date was this? 5th of March, a week before, <laughs> a week before the same announcement uh, in Kalbarri. Um, uh, initiatives to stem the dire shortage of workers' accommodation in Exmouth will be fast-tracked under a re-elected Labor government. The launch of expressions of interest for local companies to build much-needed workers, uh, needed workers, uh, several potential sites have already been identified, and a future Labor lands minister, lands minister, that's you, uh, Member for Arbidal. Yep, yep, it's got here. The Premier's actually dogged you in. He knew that you were going to take on the role. Uh, and a future Lands Minister, being new member for Armadale, uh, would grant tenure approval for the appropriate development. And, Minister, perhaps you can enlighten the House, enlighten the residents and uh, businesses what of Exmouth what actions, what actions you've taken uh, to um, fast track, fast track what the Premier has said, fast track. Um, to stem the dire shortage of work for accommodation in Exmouth. So it'll be interesting to see if you're going to get up in this debate, uh, uh, Minister for Lands, and enlighten uh, the businesses of Exmouth um, uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what actions you've taken, um, given that, that the Premier has uh, made sure that you are the, the minister responsible for delivering much needed workers' accommodation. Given the fact that the uh, Exmouth Chamber of Commerce um, has um, conducted their own survey and found over 200 employees uh, were needed and that 200, over 200 beds were needed, 
uh, to be able to accommodate the workers' um, accommodation crisis that you have in Exmouth. The groundwork has been done. Uh, when the government comes in and the, the government um, and the Premier says that they will fast track these initiatives under a re elected Labor government, well, we've got a re elected government, Labor government, um, but we're not seeing too much of that fast tracking to alleviate the pressures uh, that business is under. And members, I know that uh, quite a few of you have been travelling uh, up north um, who often see that businesses are closed uh, simply because um, those owners need some respite. They're working basically 24-7, but they need to have a day off uh, simply because they can't find uh, any employees. And if they can, there is no accommodation uh, to put those employees in. And that's happening from Exmouth uh, to Coral Bay uh, to Sharp Bay and to Kalbarri. Uh, but if you go inland, uh, and, and particularly Broome as well, and it's good to see the member for Broome, and I'm sure that the Chamber of Commerce, has, uh, Kimberley, um, has approached you uh, over the fact that there needs to be, uh, who I've met with, there needs to be workers' accommodation built, um, which, uh, which uh, is, uh, is, is what's needed. Uh, to, to be able to, because uh, member for Kimberley, as you'll be aware, you often hear uh, that Broome's full. But a lot of those hotels are only about 80% capacity because they're using the other 20% for staff, or they're using, uh, or they can't fulfil the other 20% because they've got no one to clean the rooms uh, and provide those services. So I'm sure you've got that same uh, feedback, feedback. Being the local member uh, uh, for Kimberley. Broom, um, your tourism hotspots are under a huge amount of pressure. Huge amount of pressure. So when we hear that tourism, oh, it's booming, Broom's full, Exmouth's full, Calbarry's full, Shark Bay's full, Coral Bay's full, um, the reality is it's full to the ability of being able to be as open as one can be. That is because there is a shortage of workers, and if you've got the workers, there is, a, uh, there is no workers' accommodation uh, for, um, uh, for uh, uh, these businesses to be able to maximise their profits from this wonderful opportunity where no one in West Australia can go overseas. Uh, when the borders are open, we've got people coming o over here from the East, East Coast. That's a great position, something that we've always wanted our tourism spots to be able to uh, um, uh, to really boom uh, because of uh, uh, the amount of tourists going around. But we, those businesses, those towns, can't uh, maximise uh, their uh, capture of the market because oh, simply they don't have uh, the amount of uh, workers or workers' accommodation uh, to, uh, to be able to fulfil and keep their businesses open, uh, which then causes obviously stresses and strains uh, uh, on uh, mental health issues, burnout, fatigue uh, that businesses face because simply there is no workers' accommodation for the employees if they're able to get those employees. Uh, so, members, um, uh, I hope, one, the Minister for Lands can address some of those issues. Uh, hopefully he'll stand up and talk about the workers' accommodation shortage uh, that is really gripping uh, our northern towns. Uh, we're seeing rents go sky high. Uh, the property market still remains <laughs> relatively calm in terms of sales because of the problems when it comes to uh, banks lending in regional areas. Banks find it extremely hard to lend in regional areas, hence why we don't have too many new houses being built, simply because of the demand of banks wanting a large deposit. Uh, um, to be able to start uh, that process of uh, uh, building uh, uh, building a house. So, Minister for Housing, Minister for Lands, uh, I hope you can look at Development WA, the land that the state has, and ways in which we can make that land affordable uh, so that people can build on that land, so they can build their home, so we can deal with some of uh, the, the, the uh, crisis when it comes to people wanting to live uh, in, in communities, uh, but also um, allowing for um, 
uh, you know, grow homes to be built, uh, which is a major problem in nearly every in every regional town. Not having the adequate uh, amount of uh, FTEs for government departments simply because there's no housing. Of oh, that deals with Calvary. Yes. And what has he said? Has he said that he's changed, keeps changing his mind on on what he requires from uh, Development WA? So my understanding that the the need in Calbarry, I'll give you an example, Minister. No, but uh, my question was to you. Could you ask me if I could explain? We have been trying to work with them, but the shy president keeps changing his mind what he wants. So, so Minister, and I know this is not you. I know this is not you because I. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, that may be the case. That may be the case, Leader of Opposition. But the question, but the question that can I ask that question? Asked is what development WA is doing? Can I? We try to work with him, and he keeps changing his mind. Okay, Minister. So don't shake your head, Minister, because I, I uh, don't you shake know, your head when you don't know what he's telling Minister, us. Minister, you have a chance to get up. But if I can just respond to what you've just said, um, and the only way I can respond is the pressure that the Shire of Northampton. No, no, and councillors and the whole community, and I cannot, I cannot downplay, uh, 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 play this. I'm not playing this uh, in any other way. Um, Madam Acting Speaker, Madam Acting Speaker, the minister has a chance to get up and speak. Excuse me, Minister Philans. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Uh, Minister. Not only is the member continually interjecting, but the member's continuing to interject. The, your member for Armadale. No, not only is he continually interjecting, he's continuing to interject whilst you're um, speaking. You should Members have for speaker. North West Central, uh, please, you. if um, you do not want interjections, please do not no, engage I in actually, conversation. I, I, I do respect the uh, Minister for Lands and what he has to say, but I just want to explain to this House, uh, and the Minister for Emergency Services would fully understand this as well, the pressures that the Shire of Northampton have been under is immense. It's absolutely immense. And the CEO, uh, who has been criticised, and unfairly, and I think that's just somewhat of luck of understanding of the magnitude of uh, the cyclone and the effect it's had right across the Shire of Northampton and the Midwest, as well as the Shire President uh, and councillors uh, who are bearing uh, uh, the, the burden of their community, who is under a huge amount of pressure. And like I said today, for example, Cal Barry, um, for most of the day, yes, they had no power. And that just adds to the fact that they don't have a roof uh, on, uh, on their house that's just still a tarp. Um, that they've got no one to complain to. And so who do they complain to? Uh, the Shire President, the ex Shire councillors, the staff. And so in times of, of distress, the times of, hang on a sec, community, because it's important uh, that we all understand that the pressures that they're under. Uh, when it comes to trying to work to work through what's actually needed when you've got um, your community constantly at you, um, this is where government needs to provide that support through uh, people working, uh, helping out the Shire, people on the ground, to fully ascertain what's actually needed when it comes to workers' accommodation. Because, Minister, I'll give you an example. One assessor, one assessor, um, needs 200 employees, tradies, to do that company's work. That's one. So, so workers' accommodation, and like I said, you've got. We got. Hang on a sec. I'll let you. I'll let you respond. But um, you've got a commitment made by the premier uh, prior to the election about workers' accommodation and the need for small businesses to have workers and the accommodation to be able to house them. That's one commitment which hasn't uh, been forthcoming. And then the other issue that's now transpired is the need to house uh, workers, tradies, builders, to be able to rebuild uh, places like Calbarry, Northampton, when there's a lack and no accommodation, basically, <laughs> and businesses trying to survive 
uh, trying to get tourists still to come back in. It is a absolute perfect storm of everything going wrong at the moment. Uh, and and I, I think we can all uh, take on board that the pressures of the CEO, president and councillors that are under uh, does sometimes uh, um, be, it's seen as being um, bullish uh, or being angry, and we must respect the position that they're in. Not a criticism of the Shire CEO, but just stating a fact that there has been a change of mind over a period of time what, in its mouth and Calberry actually, what they want. And of course, the cyclone then changed the position again. So, Development WA has been trying to work with both shires to accommodate what they want, but their position has changed partly as a result of the cyclone, but not only as a cyclone. And it's not just a Development WA issue, it's also a planning issue as well. So, it's also the department, so not just Development WA, both are involved trying to assist. It's very trying circumstances, but there has been changed of positions. That's not a criticism, it's just stating a fact. Um, thank you, uh, Minister for Lands. And I look forward to a resolution to uh, what is now a dire situation. And, and we're not talking even about Calberry. Um, Calberry, like I said, Exmouth goes from 2,500 people to 20,000. Uh, Calberry um, goes from a couple of hundred uh, to um, five or 6,000 people. Um, and, and, and it goes on right across uh, uh, this, um, this great state of ours, who's experiencing a wonderful opportunity uh, to grow our businesses, to grow our tourism product, to grow our regional communities, but are hamstrung because of uh, the lack of land that's uh, been um, uh, allowed to be uh, developed and built on. And those various issues are uh, because of native title holding up uh, land to be extinguished so it can be developed. Uh, services such as uh, sewerage, water, power. Um, and uh, we, we talk about sewerage ponds, for example, which is an inhibitor. Even if you want to build houses, say in Exmouth, uh, you're going to have to upgrade the sewerage treatment facility there to be able to cater for any houses. Uh, and, and the list goes on, the same in, in, in Coral Bay. Uh, you've got massive... It, it, it's expensive, Minister. Um, and, and the point, I suppose, is you've got all these massive pressures uh, that uh, visitors, uh, like everyone uh, in this chamber, I'm sure would go and visit um, uh, most regional communities, communities for a holiday, especially along the coast, uh, know how wonderful it is. But the pressure that our community, uh, communities are under uh, is huge when it, become, when it comes to housing. And the lack of investment over the last five years has culminated to this massive problem that uh, is going to take years to fix. Um, but we're not seeing even the plan going forward to build um, social housing, to take off the boards of the houses that are boarded up and, and renovate them or fix them up uh, so we can get people living in there. Um, we're not seeing that plan when it comes to workers' accommodation. We're not seeing that plan that you have to upgrade the sewage treatment plant or, or uh, places that can be developed or land to, uh, to be uh, developed can't because there is no sewerage uh, connection uh, uh, to it. So the services uh, are lacking. But there is no plan by government, and I'll go back to there is no regional development plan uh, when it comes to our regional communities uh, which will allow those houses to be built. And when it comes to the whole of Western Australia at the moment, the rental market doesn't exist. So where are people living? Where are people living? What is the plan of the government? What's the plan to uh, incorporate the private sector to be part of that uh, uh, problem solving? Where is the government uh, sitting down? Are they sitting down with Shelter WA and other community organisations? Uh, perhaps the minister could have gone to the, the housing summit, summit uh, where those ideas uh, were thrown on the table. Um, how, what plan does the government have to be able to curb this housing crisis that is crippling regional communities, 
crippling uh, those who are the most vulnerable and crippling uh, those businesses who can't get any uh, accommodation for their workers and crippling the growth of our towns and this state because there is no housing being forthcoming uh, by the state government. That's the problem. That's what we need to uh, we need to hear from the government. What's the plan moving forward? The opposition will support a plan moving forward. In the absence of a plan, well, we'll come up with a plan and we'll take it to the next election. Because when it comes to housing in this state, how there is a housing crisis that is gripping gripping um, every part of our community. Your government department's ministers that you're responsible for are all suffering because there is no grow housing. Our communities are suffering, which leads to issues, um, whether it be crime, antisocial behaviour, overcrowding occurring. This is what we're facing, members, and this is what we need the government to fix. And it's not just announcing uh, millions and millions of dollars. We need to actually see a time frame, a time frame, a plan moving forward that doesn't just include the amount of houses, because the next problem is you don't have the utilities to be able to connect to those houses, uh, and that's why you need a regional development plan. You need a plan for housing in this state, and ultimately, what plugged the holes of government in the past was royalties for regions who provided all those services so we can grow our regional communities. That's what we need to bring back, members. That will have a huge uh, difference so we can grow our regional towns, fix this housing crisis, because clearly, clearly, as I said in uh, speech last week, um, what we see is a stage. We see the Premier on the stage. He's doing the bow with all the lights on him. We see, we see the uh, Minister for Health jump on the stage to get his accolades and suddenly trips over the curtain. We've got the Minister for Housing and comes the other way to get his accolades, trips over the curtain. And what we see behind the curtain is that house, health crisis, that housing crisis, and a crisis in general uh, that this state is facing because of the smokes and mirrors and the failure and the failure to reinvest over the last five years into our state so we don't have these crisis crisis after crisis that it will be your downfall as a government it will be your downfall as a government because people can't find a house um, and uh, when the health system is is where it's at uh, i'd watch out members i'd be I'd be working, uh, working as much as possible to come up with a plan to fix these massive issues gripping our state, uh, because we've got a massive health crisis that is that is that is stopping our growth, our potential as a state moving forward. And uh, I hope the Minister for Housing, I, I have faith in you, Minister for Housing. I have faith in you, Minister for Lands, to work together, to work together to be able to create the plan that we need so that people people have a, a roof over their head. Thank you, Speaker. Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Acting Speaker. I too rise to support the motion today. Uh, and I do so because of the massive and, and can I say unnecessary housing crisis we have here in Western Australia. Now we've got a $5 billion budget surplus uh, here and we've had a budget surplus year on year because of the GST fix for this state organised by the Honourable Matthias Cormann, um, former Minister for... The federal Liberal government, who fixed the GST inequity for this state, delivering billions, delivering billions of dollars to this state government above their forecast budget, and on top of Minister that, a for massive. Police. Can you please stop from interject? A massive windfall, a massive windfall from uh, from royalties right through the term of this government. So there is no excuse for where we are, and and no excuse in particular. Because this government, this minister sitting opposite here, Minister for Police, the new Minister for Housing, the new Minister for Lands, they've sat in this, they've sat in this, this parliament, they've sat in this parliament, new Minister for Emergency Services, uh, sat in this parliament 
and, and heard from this side the crisis that this state faces. I came into this parliament in 2018. I, I, came, I came into this parliament in 2018. I came into this parliament in 2018. And when I came into this parliament, Tony Kristovich, uh, the former member for Kareem, um, passionately. Oh, for goodness sake, please, Acting Speaker. Ministers, it's great you're all here, but can we please just let the Leader of the Liberal Party speak? Thank you. Thank you very much, Acting Speaker. I would appreciate uh, at least a few less needless interjections. Um, Tony Kristovich, who's the former member for Kareen, in this chamber, and when I, from the first day I came into this chamber, the first day I came into this chamber, he raised the issue of homelessness. And he raised it right in the Premier's electorate. And that is in the Premier's electorate, in front of the Pem Premier, and I know because I used to be the, the head of the uh, Quinana Industries Council, and my office was based down that way. I used to drive past there and see that. Oh, for Matt, acting speaker, please, can I have some clear Let me air? get in the chair first. <laughs> Thank you very much. Continue. Thank you very much, Acting Speaker. I will be grateful for your support. Tony Christovich, the former member for Kareen, in this very place, raised the problem in the Premier's own electorate in Rockingham. We had people, desperate people, sleeping rough in the Premier's electorate on the road that he drives past to get to Parliament from his house. And, and the Premier was alerted to that. He was alerted to the crisis. He was alerted to the fact that, in fact, people had died in that camp, um, sleeping rough in that camp, because they had nowhere else to go. Do you know how long it took the Premier? Now, I'm not talking about the Premier of the state going and visiting some far-flung place. I'm talking about the Premier in his own electorate. It took the Premier two years two years to actually go and visit that camp. You know, members, for all your foibles around this chamber and for all the things that we may disagree with, I'm pretty sure that all of you as local members in that situation would have gone and visited those people in that community like I visit people who are homeless in my community uh, and discuss the issues with them. And I know you do that. It took this Premier, this arrogant Premier, two years to go and visit people who were homeless in his own electorate. And then it took some considerable time after that for the matter to actually be dealt with only because the member of Kareen was dogged in highlighting the issue of homelessness. And he didn't just highlight the issue of homelessness uh, down in Rockingham. He highlighted the issue of homelessness right across metropolitan Perth and right across this state. So, you know, I have some sympathy for the new Minister for Housing. I know that the new Minister for Housing uh, is passionate about this issue and wants to do something about it. But we're not talking about a new government. We're not talking about a government that's just come in, they're trying to deal with issues from the past. We're talking about a government that is heading in, uh, it's four and a half years in. And, and now we're hearing about plans or plans to plan. Now we're hearing about plans and things that might be done. This crisis sits at your feet. This Labor government, who has simply been completely inadequate with dealing with this issue over the last four and a half years. And as I say, I know this uh, current minister is, uh, is passionate about this topic. I've in invited and I've had private discussions with the minister you know, about this issue in my electorate, and I won't go into that uh, detail. In the same way, I don't play politics on serious issues like this. In the same way, where my sports... In the same way that with, my, uh, with sports clubs in my electorate, I invite the sporting minister down in private meetings to have a discussion. And I was, must say I was a bit disturbed that the minister would then say uh, that he tries to use that for some political point score in here. I didn't try and use that for my political advantage inviting him down. I invite him down privately to discuss those matters in my electorate and introduce him to the people in those sporting clubs that needed some help and assistance um, in exactly the same way that I respect the current, uh, the current housing minister. So I know he's trying to do something. The problem with this government is you've got a government that's paralysed um, by an emperor who makes all of the decisions. Now, we get the reports that the thing about, the thing about humans is, the thing about humans is they, people discuss, people discuss, and they talk about things. And we hear what happens in Cabinet. And I'll tell you what you do in Cabinet, keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, otherwise you'll get it kicked off. That's, that's what we hear. 
That's what we hear. Well, we'll find out. We'll find out, you know. And if you're a chosen, if you're in the chosen group, if you're in the chosen group, you're fine. Don't put your head up otherwise. Well, let me tell you, I think I think this Premier, um, this Premier, whatever his characterisation of the former Premier was, whatever his characterisation of the... Oh, honestly. Whatever his characterisation of the former Premier was, um, he clearly uh, was enamoured with the model, can I say, as he stated it. Clearly was enamoured with the model. And, you know, it is in my own electorate, in my own electorate, uh, and glad to hear from you, Member from Coburn, not surprised. In my own electorate, in my own electorate of Cottesloe, in my own electorate of Cottesloe, one in 30 residents, one in 30 residents in my electorate in Cottesloe lives in social housing. Now, um, that compares, Member for Coburn, with you. That compares, um, uh, Member for Coburn, there's 3.2% of the people that live in my electorate live in social housing. Coburn, the great moral crusader, Member for Coburn, only 2.4%. Only 2.4%. Yes, and we know you've got a chip on your shoulder because you went to a public school and you had to put up with private school kids at uni and we've heard it all. Well, member, member, let's uh, let's go on. Let's go on. 2.4% social housing in the city of Coburn. 2.4% social housing in the city of Coburn. 2.4% social housing in the, in the city of Coburn, 3.2% in, in my electorate. And I passionately care about those people. I passionately care about those people. I go down to the loner's lunch, I talk with them, I discuss the issues and I try and help those people with their, um, with their particular problems. When they come to my office, I try and... When they come to my office, City of Rockingham... City of Rockingham only has 3.1% social housing. I will say Armadale um, definitely has a, a, a bigger issue in that 4.2%, so 1% more than Cottesloe. But it is an issue that affects all of us, and we see that right across the state. But what do we see the response to this government after four years? This government, after four years, uh, has reduced social housing by... Uh, 1,372, and and that's not our that's not a number we made up. That's in answers to questions asked by the Honourable Steve Martin um, uh, on the 17th of June 2001. So on the 30th of June 2017, 44,087 public houses. Now down to 42,715. So this is the party, the bleeding heart socialists, who care about those people doing it tough, who care about those people doing it tough. You know, you know what, Member for Wanneroo, if you think you won... Order, uh, Madam Acting Speaker, I am really doing this problem on my left here. Would you mind telling the Member for, I think it's Wanneroo, uh, to respect the uh, Member on his feet? Uh, member for Wanneroo, if you think you won the election on your response to social housing, then you're delusional. Uh, and I might say uh, a good chance it's one of the things you'll lose the next election on the way you're going. All of your arrogance, all of your hub hubris, in four years, this government went backwards. This government houses few, fewer people in social housing after four and a half years than the previous government uh, did. So that's something you should be ashamed about, members, all of you, because this is your government. Now, despite sitting on your massive surplus, um, despite having all of that, and that's through this term, you have simply not stepped up and done your job. What you've done is forced people onto the streets by selling those public houses and not replacing them. Now, we know on this side that you need to turn over public housing stock. We know that. That's part of the business, and that was happening under the previous government. But you don't put that money into consolidated revenue. You put that money into building more houses. So what have we got a situation now? Because the federal and state governments have pump prized the construction, pump primed the construction industry so much, now it's going to be almost impossible for this government to catch up, simply because we do not have the workers uh, to do the work. All available workforce is tied up um, in residential projects. In fact, I'm told the pipeline is probably two to three years long. It's going to be an enormous challenge because this government didn't do anything 
Because this government didn't do anything in the last four years to properly deal with this issue, and in fact they sold uh, houses. And as I say, I feel um, I feel sorry for the uh, the challenge that has been presented to the new minister because the new minister um, has been handed a suicide pass. And I know he's passionate. I know he's, he's a, I know he's a clever. I know he's well. I won't go down that path, Minister, but can I say um, he has been given an enormously difficult uh, task by a government that did nothing in the last um, four years. And compare that, compare that to the 6,000 public houses built by the Liberal National Government. 6,000 additional houses built under the Liberal National Government. You've run it down. Um, if we look at the and, and look at the issues, um, there's a report ending homelessness um, uh, in Western Australia, the 2021 report, um, published on the 3rd of August um, 2021, uh, the Centre for Social Justice and the University of Western Australia, and um, and let's have a look at that. So if we go back to July 17, uh, 2017, number of clients accessing specialist homeless services in Western Australia who were on homeless or on entry support, 2000. 251 uh, in 2017, now 3,099. 3,099 members. So 750, a massive increase uh, in those people seeking those support. That dimensions and, and continues to mention not just what we see on the streets, um, but in real numbers. And we know, members, that it's the most vulnerable people in society who are the victims of this. We know that, in, in and this is based on this report, 29%, almost 30% of homeless people uh, are people, uh, are Aboriginal people uh, in this state. And, and so there's a, a group that already suffers enormous disadvantage um, in a number of aspects. And here we see almost one in three homeless people being Aboriginal um, people. Um, and, and, and a whole range of challenges, and look, I won't go through all of it because of uh, time, um, but look, 25% of those people only had an educational attainment to year nine or lower. So people with real challenges um, in a whole range of areas, um, uh, but uh, 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 particular challenges um, with particular issues. Um, two thirds of male, one third of female. Um, now here's the real thing. We hear about the emergency crisis, the presentation to EDs. This is your own doing. Exactly as the member for North West Central outlined very clearly earlier on, exactly one of the root causes of the stress on our hospital system at the moment. Um, and, and that is that nearly half of the people who are living uh, uh, are homeless, nearly 48.7% or 48.7% had gone to the emergency department due to not feeling emotionally well or because of their of because of their nerves. More than half reported a diagnosis of depression, 58.7%, uh, anxiety, 52.3%. Almost a third of the people reported a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, 26.2% uh, had been diagnosed with psychosis. Um, we go over the page. Emergency department, accidents emergency centres were visited an average of 3.5 times per person in the six months prior to the survey. So what we see is these people who are living rough exactly as the member for North West Central did. There's no chicken and egg here. When people are forced out onto the streets, they suffer anxiety, they suffer depression, their medical conditions are not treated properly. And because of that, they end up in ED departments. And what we've seen, and this is not my statistics, members, this is from a respected uh, research group based at the University of Western Australia, what they're saying is a substantially larger number of people who are out there on the streets seeking help in the term of this government. So those people, and they're the people that are turning up. Um, on average, um, uh, uh, if you compare the number of hospitalisations, a dramatic increase in hospitalisations um, for people who are living rough um, on the streets. So when we talk about the hospital crisis, what we see is that is intimately, intrinsically linked uh, to this government's failure um, to deal with homelessness. Um, if we go on to, you know, and, and look, Geraldton has been a focus. I've spent four days in Geraldton uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, uh, talking to people in the community. Um, we had our, um, what we call our, our winter love in there um, and uh, went out and spent a lot of time talking to people in the, the community in Geraldton. And look, Geraldton overall, Geraldton overall is, is doing well. 
The economy in Geraldton is doing well. Um, and certainly better than when I was uh, last there about 12 months ago um, and spent some time there. Um, certainly the shops, are, you know, there's more shops that are open and, and people are generally buoyant. But, but there's the other side to it. And as was pointed out by the, by the member uh, for North West Central, you know, uh, uh, there's almost a thousand people in that area on the streets. But, it, you know, statistics and statistics, and we talk about the houses. I actually went out um, and, and had a look at that issue. I went out into the, into the suburbs and had a look and, and uh, looked at the issues um, that were going on um, out there. Now, I heard what the minister said today about those houses, but I'll tell you what's happening in Geraldton, members. What's happening in Geraldton, the Red Cross in Geraldton is giving out tents. They're giving out tents so that homeless people have somewhere to live. That's what they're doing in that great city of Geraldton, in an economy that's otherwise um, doing well. They're, they're handing out tents. Um, I, went to the, uh, I went to the old Batavia Motor Inn in Geraldton, um, and uh, it was a sort of a property deal gone wrong. And what did I see in, in, in the Batavia Motor, Motor Inn? It's something like something out of a dystopian movie, you know, of, of some futuristic nightmare. Here we are in this prosperous community. May I have an extension, please, Acting Speaker? Extension granted. Thank you very much. In this prosperous community, we have desperate people who are... And, and I, I, I did um, see some of the people in that area and a couple of my colleagues went and spoke to them. I did not want to go there as a big group because I think sometimes people in that situation feel humiliated. Um, and so I didn't want to do that. But I did have their conversation really back. And I spoke to um, people in that community that regularly interact with those people in the Batavia Motor Inn. Now, those people, those poor people, they've gone up, they've put boards up, they're trying to make themselves secure. They have to carry um, bottles of water up flights of stairs. Um, they do that so that they can actually use the toilets and, and, and flush them and so on. Those people, those people would happily live in those boarded up houses if um, those houses were available. They would happily live there. Now, I accept what the minister says. There may be some circumstances where that's not possible. I went and saw the houses that are only five years old. They were, on the external appearances, beautiful uh, uh, houses. Something I can tell you, uh, well, all of the houses I saw were dramatically better than the house I lived in when I was a child. I can tell you that. Um, but I tell you what, member, I learn and I look. Oh, yeah. So those ones that we refer to have, have serious bad lives, and as a result, some of the material were not appropriate for public housing tenants. Sure. They will be refurbished, but that's the point I make, is, is that on the simple assessment, you may simply say, oh, we can't, you know, you should just do that instantly. But there are sometimes reasons so, and very clear and, and, reasons. And, and that's the thing, Minister. Look, I, I accept that point, Minister, and, and I accept that this is not a, not a trivial issue. So I accept the point you're making. But we're four and a half years in. They, they didn't board those houses up yesterday. Those houses have been progressively, and I spoke to the people in that community, progressively being boarded up over years. So the government has had time to do something about that. And, and look, I hear the argument. I hear the argument about the wraparound um, services requirement. But again, I mean, this is no mystery. You know, we know generically, as, as a generalisation, probably about half the people who are homeless um, uh, or, in fact, half the people living in, living in social housing um, have mental health and or um, drug issues. And, and it's not their fault. There are it's just unfortunate people in the community and it's, it's, it's you know, the worst for them, obviously, that they have um, those afflictions. And, and that's why it's a holistic thing. And that's why four and a half years in, you've got those wraparound services. Um, you know, we've got a... Um, uh, we, we've got a minister that is uh, is responsible uh, for that area. We've got a minister for community services. Now, in conjunction with the minister for housing, that's the job of the minister for community services. What do we hear from the minister of community services in this place? We hear the minister for community services talking about a plan. What's going to happen in six months' time, some months' time, a year's time, two years' time? That minister's been there for four and a half years. And, and I've heard this from this minister the whole time she's been there. Now, I know the Minister for Community Services is a compassionate person. I know that. 
I don't doubt her level of compassion. I don't doubt the level of compassion of most of the people in this room. But having compassion and being to say in a, in a great thing, in a great voice how much you care makes no difference. When you're the government, you do something about it. You actually go in and do something about it. Now, this government hasn't done enough about it in the last four and a half years. The reason there's a large population in that Batavia um, Motor Inn, and I, I can tell you what, they, when I looked in that dwelling, actually, they'd done a pretty good job of setting up as best they could a secure housing apartment. Now, I know there are periodic issues, but I was talking to, you know, as it transpires, um, the mayor there is a neighbour. Now, the mayor interacts with those people Typically, they do not have um, horrendous problems. They have problems sometimes with people that come and visit and so on. But that's why you have those wraparound services um, in those plates. So, you know, it was, it was just um, fascinating to go there. But members, you know, I've got all over this state um, since I've um, taken on this leadership role. My job, for an opposition, we do what we can in Parliament, but our job is to get out, visit, learn, listen to people and help where we possibly can um, and mostly make sure mostly make sure mostly make sure that we hold this government to account I mean I've been I've been to Cunanara, Broome, Derby, Fitzroy Crossing, Halls Creek through the Pilbara, Ningaloo, the Murchison, Carnarvon, Kalgoorlie, Geraldton, Bunbury, Albany, Esperance, Mount Barker, Mount Barker near the famous and wonderful town of Cranbrook uh, in the southwest of Western Australia and I'll tell you what was, the, what was a simple fact in every single one of those communities, in every single one, was the issue of homelessness. I was, homelessness. I was in Esperance. Um, now, Esperance is a wealthy town. And any of you that have, uh, you, you'd know Esperance, it's a wealthy, it's a beautiful town. It's benefited from government expenditure on amenities uh, and, and facilities. In Esperance tonight, there'll be a dozen people sleeping rough, at least, in Esperance. And th these are people that are sleeping around the town. They cannot get housing. They cannot get housing. And again, I spoke to the Shire and I spoke to community groups there. Th these are not people who can't be housed. These are not people who can't, um, can't um, you know, handle the housing properly. These are people who can't get houses. And, and you know, that's, I mean, again, in a, in a beautiful, wealthy community, um, we can't have that. And, and, and I do see in the government's notice, and I see, um, you know, the Minister uh, for uh, uh, Community uh, Development, uh, Community Services, I should say, I see the Minister's announced now a $6 million program to work with, sh with shires. Now, that's fine, $6 million. It's 0.001% of the $5 billion surplus, so you know, hardly reaching too deeply into the pocket on that one. Um, but to work with the shires, since when has be, uh, uh, providing housing uh, been a mainstream function of the shires? But the shires are desperate. I see that in Halls Creek, see it in Cunanara, um, Broome, Fitzroy Crossing. You know, in Fitzroy Crossing, the, the local um, um, uh, uh, prescribed body corporates have got together and, and they're actually building their own housing because they're so desperate for housing in that community because the government can't help. When I was, um, when I was in uh, Geraldton, um, and, and there's a, just an incredible, I think, I think there's basically, a, uh, if a house comes on the market, it, it disappears in a day uh, in, in uh, Geraldton. Um, um, I drove around there, and I took a good drive around the community. Lots of development WA blocks, lots of them. Beautiful big development WA signs on them. Do you know what they all are, members? They're bush. They're all bush, and they've been bush for the term of this government. So big on signs, but not developing the land that requires uh, uh, the, the, uh, the land required for housing uh, in that town. Um, you know, members, the, the, the tragedy of this debate is that every member on this side could, could speak for an hour on this and, and only just be scratching the surface of the topic. You know, I hear all about the plans for the future, but as a government, you have to accept that for four and a half years you have been completely inadequate uh, in dealing with this issue. And, and despite the well-meaning ministers um, in their roles, uh, we have seen nothing uh, to indicate that this government is treating this problem with the seriousness that it deserves. We know that there needs to be at least 3,500 new social houses just to cope 
uh, with the backlog and get this into a, uh, the back into a position that the government came into at the start, um, given the growth in requirement. So that's the challenge before this government. And as I say, despite the well-meaning nature of individuals, I see no—I have no optimism whatsoever that this government will be able to deliver this. And this government should be ashamed of its poor performance in this area. Madam Acting Speaker. And before all. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. And can I um, just certainly back up, back up both the member for North West Central and the uh, member for Cottesloe and support the member for North West Central's motion that this House condemns the Labor government for its failure to prioritise housing in the last five years of government, creating a housing crisis the state has never seen before and triggering significant economic and social consequences. And I think uh, I think the member for Cottesloe summed it up very well. Every, every member in this House could quite easily stand up here and talk for an hour without even blinking because all of us as regional members and metropolitan members have got issues. We're getting contacted, uh, if not on a daily basis, at least every couple of days. And I think the thing that sums it up for me is the, um, the statement made by the Minister for Housing today in question time when he says, we've lost over 300 houses due to our decision, but it was the right decision, member for North West Central. So I, um, I have to question that. I have to question that when the, when the Minister for Housing proudly says that we've lost over 300 houses due to our decision, but it was the right decision. So um, question marks there. And I think, as the member for Cottesloe said, four and a half years, um, this government, we saw in the last term of government, uh, they took great put and pride in blaming the previous government, the previous financial situation, spent about three and a half years blaming everyone else and wouldn't take any responsibility. Well, now you are in the second term of government. Uh, you've been in there for four and a half years. You're predicted to have a $5 billion surplus, and you've got a health, uh, health department in crisis, and now you've got a housing department in crisis as well. And it's time these ministers took responsibility. And the first thing I want to concentrate on is the, uh, the uh, government regional officer housing situation in the regional areas especially. Um, it's such an important part of our, um, of our housing stock in this state. And uh, the Honourable Colin de Grusser asked a, um, a question in, uh, in the uh, Upper House recently on the um, 10th of August asking what was the total um, number of grow stock as at June 21 just to try and get a handle on what's happening. And the total number of housing stock is 5,040 properties, but we've got 217 additional requests for grow housing from our client agencies. And a couple of the highlights there are 88 with the Department of Education still on the waiting list and 59 for the WA Police Force. And I think, uh, Madam Acting Speaker, this is where we see examples where our, um, our communities, our regional communities especially, uh, at the public service, we're in, we're in real crisis there because we have our, um, we have our schools, we have the situation we've, we've got a um, principal that's left, we need a replacement principal, we advertise. Um, but lo and behold, we actually haven't got a house for that principal to come to. So they're getting put up in places. Uh, I look at a place like Nibing in my electorate of Row, where uh, over the past they've struggled to actually get those principals uh, there or, ha or teachers, and so they're having to be put up in um, other people's houses or the, down at the hotel down the road. And it's not just for a week or two, it's months on end. So, this is a critical uh, shortage that we're seeing out there, and it's something that's really, really uh, starting to create problems for not only the Department of Education but for our police force as well. And we've had examples here today. Uh, member for uh, Cottesloe just mentioned places like Fitzroy Crossing, 
uh, places like Broome, where we're actually starting to have some real crime issues due to the housing situation. So it's a twofold. We've got the crime issues because we've got homeless people out on the streets creating the crime, and then at the same time we've got uh, the likes of our WA police force who can't actually find places for their officers to live in. So that's a twofold situation. Um, it's one that I'm I'm really concerned about, and I think um, the other part of it is the maintenance situation and. We've, we've seen recently the member for North West Central has mentioned it many times, the, uh, the Pindan situation, the, uh, the, the contract for maintenance. I know um, that's now been reassigned. That's now been reassigned, which I'm pleased to hear. I'm pleased to hear, but what I've got to say is that I believe the Minister for Housing needs to have a look at the whole structure of his maintenance program right around the state. Because we've got places like the Great Southern, we've got places like the Great renewed, Southern. Renewed by your government. We have got places like the Great Southern, where we've actually got uh, we've actually got Madam Acting Speaker, Madam Acting Speaker. We know the we know the Minister for Commerce moved her legislation through the House. Um, just as the uh, the Pindan situation was was happening, with no protection no protection for those uh, subcontractors, and now we're seeing the results, and we've seen plenty of people left out of pocket. But that's not what I want to focus on. What I want to talk about is these contracts, where we've got places like uh, Katanning, Nyabing, Kojanup, Wajan, they're being uh, maintained by a company in Bunbury. And it was only yesterday I had a constituent of mine who's a small business owner, electrician, um, in one of my local towns, and he rang me up because he's actually distraught with the amount of compliance, with the amount of government red tape that he has to go through every week trying to um, sort out those issues, which for him, he just wants to get out there, fix houses, do his job. Um, but he's becoming so frustrated, he actually rang me up yesterday and he's quite distraught. And part of this is the scenario where big companies place in places three and four hours away from where they've got the contract and they just try and subcontract it off to someone and try and uh, pick, up, pick up a bit of a profit on the way through. So the Minister for Housing needs to look at restructuring these maintenance contracts, restructuring it so that the local Homes West people, the local people looking at these grow houses and the like, can actually get local people to do the job quickly and efficiently. And uh, I had a classic over the uh, winter break. A constituent of mine rang me up. His daughter um, was there on holidays. She's um, up in that uh, Malawa Morawa region. What happens? Um, her house got broken into uh, while she was on holidays seven hours away. Um, hadn't been dealt properly with in the first place by the department. And then they are trying to tell her that she needs to come back up there, drive up seven hours to come and secure her house, if you can believe it. So he rang me up because his daughter was um, distraught, firstly that she'd been broken into, but secondly that the department was trying to demand that she come up and secure her place which hadn't been secured properly by them in the first place. So um, they're the issues. Uh, we've got crime issues in the uh, North West. We've got our young teachers, many of them who are keen. They love the regions. They love coming out to the regions and they think that they're making a difference, and they are on many occasions. And what's happening is they're, they're becoming disillusioned because they're actually under threat. They are under threat from people breaking into their houses and um, they get to a point where they love their school and they love their community but they don't want to stay there any longer because they're frightened. So we're going to have a point now and we're at a point I think out in the lands where we haven't got, uh, we're really struggling for teachers at all um, and we've now got the flying squadron coming in from the uh, Department of Education and the like uh, because we've got a situation now with this housing scenario where people are too frightened to even stay in their own house. So 
Um, Minister, Grove Housing in the, in the Great Southern fell from 274 houses in 2015-16 to 226 in 2020, and in the South West it went from 243 houses to 188 in 2020. So that, they're, the, they're the sort of figures. And in regional WA, between 2015 and 2020, we've lost 635 properties which have been sold out of the GROW program. So I, I, don't know, I don't know how you can explain that, how you can stand up there. I know you were talking about social housing and the like, but I don't know how you can explain that away that when we've, we've got shortage of um, people coming out into the regions, police officers, teachers, how you can stand up there and say, it's not a problem, we've sold 635 properties, um, but things are going well. Do so, you um, know the biggest sale of the Royal Bowers in the Royal Bowers? That was? 2015-2016 well, in your government. You're in government now. You started you're in the now. sales program. It you're was your in government program, now, and I'm, that's a fact. I'm talking about the fact that you've been in government for four and a half years. It's been well, re well recorded um, by the Honourable Steve Martin in the other place um, that there is over 1,300 houses gone, 1,300 houses gone, and we've we've got real issues with our with our not only our policemen and our teachers, but um, you know our doctors, our health staff. Um, the risk of moving to a rural town is too high. Um, unless housing is affordable and secure. And as the, uh, as the um, member for Cottesloe pointed out, um, in Esperance, on Monday, there were four properties available for rent at an average of $300 per week. So we've got, we've got up to um, a dozen or 15 people at any time, on any night, uh, homeless in, uh, in Esperance, which is, I think that is something unheard of. And, uh, when I look at some of our other towns in Narragin um, today, there's only one house uh, on, on the real estate website for rent. In Catanning, there's five houses. Two of them are a three by one for $650 a week. So uh, you're not going to find anyone there. And in Lake Grace, there are none. There's one in Cogenup, one in Wagen, one in Cranbrook, two in Ravensthorpe. None in Pingrup, Ongrup, Williams, Dumbyung, Hope Town, Noangrup or Darkin. So in the, in the electorate of Row, which spans 106,000 square kilometres, there are 10 houses for rent. So uh, this is a real issue and uh, I'm looking forward, we've, we've heard about it, the government solutions, the WA recovery plan. So the, the Great Southern Recovery Plan promised in 2020 $80 million for targeted maintenance programs for regional, social, remote and government worker housing properties, including 200 homes in the Great Southern Region, and $141.7 million to refurbish social housing across WA's ageing housing <laughs> stock, including 30 homes in the Great Southern Region. So um, I'm looking forward to it, uh, Minister, because it's great to make these announcements. Uh, we hear it all the time, but we're not seeing it on the ground. And that, that's, that's what I'm concerned about. And I'm really concerned when I've got people in Esperance ringing me up, talking about how many people are homeless every night. Now, if I can, I'd like to, um, I'd like to just also refer my favourite subject, of course, Minister, as you know, the um, Katanning Regional Emergency Accommodation Centre. I, I will continue to persevere um, to get yourself and the Minister for Communities to come and have a look at that situation because that is a, a great model of funding um, what you could do to fund emergency accommodation. It's a great model um, and it's a great model for uh, those families especially those women facing domestic violence. So I certainly look forward to uh, hosting you the next time you are in the Katanning region. I nearly, um, I nearly, nearly uh, 
got you there the other week when you were at Tambla, but not to be. So I look forward to, at some stage in the not too distant future, um, you visiting, visiting us. The other thing I want to talk about uh, briefly today is the, the mental health strain that homelessness is actually putting on the, uh, on the whole health system. And I think uh, we've just seen it recently in the last couple of days. And I was pleased today to hear the Minister for Health um, recognising the mental health situation. Um, and I look forward to actually seeing that package come to fruition in the, the state budget. But there's some really interesting figures um, that our, clearly our mental health beds are in a dire shortage in WA. And sadly, people experiencing homelessness are among some of the very long stayers in mental health wards. And um, in 2019, uh, from a Mental Health Commission inpatient survey, uh, what it pointed out, which I found was quite surprising to me, that of the 656 <laughs> mental health inpatients occupying a bed at the time of the survey, 178 or 27.1 per cent were deemed unable to be discharged because of a lack of suitable community-based accommodation or mental health support services. And um, recently, across the, um, the Perth, uh, Royal Perth Bentley Group, which um, has a, a history of the mental health hospital admissions, um, of 417 individuals, they accumulated 23,647 psychiatric bed days in a two-year period. So the cost of this to the health system is 35.8 million in, in psych bed days, and that's equivalent to $86,000 per person. So I, I think that's um, obviously a very, uh, very concerning figures, and I think what it demonstrates is that uh, as it said, 27.1% of those uh, homeless had, had mental health issues. And I think um, the cumulative, um, an, an example was a cumulative health care cost for three individuals over a 33-month um, period um, were extreme and they really placed um, the health system under extreme pressure and what, what we need to do, we've actually got to treat homelessness as a combined health and social issue. So I think it would be uh, great to see if the... Uh, can I have a short extension, please, extension Madam Acting granted. Speaker? It would be great to see if the, uh, the health minister could um, combine, if the health and housing ministers could combine to actually work out a strategy um, to deal with both uh, mental health and homelessness because um, they are linked. And we've seen um, some, of, some of the stats which uh, the member for Cottesloe spoke about where we've got 9,000 people in WA experiencing homeless every, homelessness every day, 1,041 homeless in Perth and Fremantle um, in May 2021. And of course, uh, examples uh, coming out thick and fast recently, where Food Bank have seen an increase in their usual customers. Um, we've had the Anglicare um, scenario, where they've seen a demand for emergency relief and food assistance triple in 2021. And of course, the recent example where the Salvos are actually having to pay car registration um, for people um, to actually sleep in their car. That, that's a short-term solution, but it's, I think our community is in a sad state of affairs when the Salvation Army has to actually pay car registration to keep people um, out on the, the street in their car. And I, I think there's been, there's been many newspaper articles recently um, indicating some of the issues and I know that we've had, uh, I know that we've had the, the COVID scenario and what's happened. It's almost as if there has been a, um, a scenario where people, uh, and we've seen it from both landlords and tenants. Uh, we've had tenants that don't want to pay their rent. And then we've had landlords that have said, well, 
If they're not going to pay that, I would rather leave my house vacant. And I'm sure this is this is added to it. And it's a situation <laughs> where it's not really anyone's fault as far as that goes. Uh, that, that's just a scenario that, that has played out. But I'm really concerned, and I think um, as an opposition, we know we know these are extraordinary times, and I know the culmination of many factors has caused an avalanche of uh, issues. But on this occasion, we're we're just focusing on on housing. We've identified this as uh, probably the second most major issue that the government's got on its hands after health. But what's been missing from this Labor government is any discernible strategy to soften the blow within our, within our communities. Um, these individuals are in real crisis, Madam Acting Speaker. Um, this can't be solved by the blame game, as I've said. Um, you're in government now. You've been here for four and a half years. You've had that time to build the strategy. Um, you can own the solution to these serious problems, but what we've had so far is a minister... We've had a lot of yelling, we've had a lot of screaming. Uh, we saw it in question time today. I look forward to this minister providing a solution. Minister for Housing. Thank you. Uh, given that we've listened to the opposition for nearly two hours, Respectfully, uh, I would like to uh, map out uh, map out uh, our government's agenda, but also raise uh, plenty of the issues that the opposition has decided uh, for a prong for attack. And I think the first issue, which is really important, is their definition of a crisis, because what is very clear. Is, is that their defi definition of a crisis is built on the 17,000 waiting list. You would have noticed in question time today, they actually said it repeatedly as one of their basis for their crisis. What is actually extraordinary about that is that when you actually do look at the statistics and the evidence, the largest housing crisis is actually of their own making back in 2010. And let's be very clear on that, that the waiting list at the height was 24,136. So that can't be denied. It is on uh, the public record at the height. So they've said we're at a crisis at 17,000. I didn't interject with you, member, so... Well, I showed you all respect and I listened attentively. That is the case. So if 17,000 is problematic, then what was 24,000? Apparently that was a walk in the park. Uh, and we have to understand that uh, that was quite an extraordinary time. And actually, you have to also look at the wait times. Because under our government, the wait times have actually significantly reduced. Again, the peak was under the previous government when wait times increased to a nearly a year longer than they are now. So peaking at 158 weeks uh, in 2014-2015. So in fact, wait times under the previous Liberal National Coalition government were worse almost every year under the, previous get, under the previous government than they are now. And also bailiff evictions were higher under the Liberals and Nationals in 2015-2016. I also note that they like to crow about the significant investment. But again, as I said on the public record, the most significant funding commitment to Western Australia was part of the Kevin Rudd government. And that did fuel massive social housing expansion across Western Australia. I also note uh, that remote communities have also suffered. We've had to face a cost pressure there because the Commonwealth yanked out $146 million annually from the system. Now, we invest nearly $200 million a year in remote housing. So we've had 147 
taken out of the system every year thanks to the federal government. So these are actually statistics that cannot be ignored. This is actually the reality of the record of the previous uh, government. And we've also now inherited ageing stock. The average uh, stock is around 30 years. We have a proportion that are 40 years. And that has left us with significant challenges that we have to deal with as a state. We also heard from the member for North West claims of bullying or threats. And I want to be very clear on the public record. I have an excellent relationship with all my stakeholders. And not once have I or aware of any other minister making a threat or bullying any advocacy organisation in the social sector field and those that I engage with. I will have disagreements. But it will be respectful, and I have done that. I understand that social housing agencies have to put their best foot forward. I get that. But I have to focus on the pragmatic and practical actual deliveries. And I did raise the proposal by Shelter WA that looked at suggesting 157 one-bedroom units in Carnarvon. And I did say that was inappropriate and it was not warranted. Uh, and that it is very easy to simply go along and say we should pluck out any of these types of land, but actually the de delivery is, is far more nuanced than either some advocacy groups wish to recognise or the opposition. In regards to grow housing, I do note that it was the previous government under the Liberal National Coalition that began the aggressive sales program because of the debt collected with the GROW program of $180 million. Uh, we have paused those sales, and I note that there has been an increase in the number of GROW housing, whether it is leased or, or purchased or other means, of around 2.6 per cent or 129 uh, grow houses. And as the minister, I've actually for the first time brought together a forecasting group to predict and look at future trends, look at eligibility requirements and see if we can get better outcomes from the grow house system. Now the member mentioned about there being demand for an extra 200 placements. That does not necessarily mean demand right now. That could mean demand in the future. We ask agencies, what do you need? But of course, uh, we go out, we use a multitude of means, including spot purchasing or, or leasing, to meet that future demand. Um, Geraldton has been raised uh, repeatedly. And again, I think this really does demonstrate the complexity of, of the issues at hand. And I have said it before, and I say it sincerely, but it is not simply a matter of plonking people in a refurbished house. There has to be good wraparound services, like the Thrive Program, which is a $58 million program, uh, and not like the opposition suggests with the First Nations Homelessness Project that's a $50,000 request. It's a million dollar program that was cut funding by the federal government, but we have our own program of $58 million that makes a substantial investment in wraparound services. But be very clear on Geraldton that there were properties available that people did not want to move into. So what that shows is a bigger symptomatic problem that we face, and that is particular precincts, particular streets, particular hubs, which are not attractive for people to live, or a perception. And that is something that is a significant struggle. And as I said, there is real complexity about this, about do we make a decision that ultimately there should be demolition or private sales, recognising the impact on social housing stock, or do we make a decision to refurbish, work to make the suburbs more attractive and for more people wanting to live there? Now, I think that's an honesty to the community, to the public, 
about the problems and challenges that we face in social housing delivery. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, and as I mentioned with Brownlee Towers, again, uh, I'm not celebrating the fact, as, as the member for Rose suggested, that there was a closure of 300, but ultimately it became a decision that was the best outcome for the local community in that area, given the social behavioural problems. So it is not a simplistic policy that the opposition consistently tries to paint. And I, and I think that is the dishonesty that we've seen in this debate, and I say this sincerely and respectfully, that it is simply boarded up houses, refurbish them and get them back on and all the problems are fixed. Well, it's not. What I'm demonstrating is, is that it is quite nuanced, that from street to street, it is actually quite complex. Today, I met the regional managers and directors from all regions across Western Australia. And every time, and I've been criticised because I was out in Kalgoorlie meeting the regional managers' teams there, but at every regional trip, when I meet local governments, I make a real effort to go out and engage with regional frontline staff to talk about what's what working, not working. And they actually do go out and show me some of the boarded houses. And I'll give you an example in Kalgoorlie. There was a group set of group units and dwellings. And because of antisocial behaviour, they actually made the decision to close some of those units because actually it was the best social behavioural outcome that they could generate. So that again shows the complexity that when you see boarded houses, there are conscious decisions can be made by regional staff that it is actually in the best interest of those units. And this is the other complexity, again, which the opposition fails to recognise. It is not just plonking people into public housing, but it's also getting the right mix. That in Kalgoorlie, you can't put families from different regions in the same social housing complex because it might generate significant social issues. Now, I'm acknowledging those issues. We're trying to say this is a more complex matter. Have an honest conversation with the community. But I will not gloss over it like we do have by the opposition. There is no recognition of this. It's just very simple black and white politics and policy by the National Party and the Liberal Party, when we're actually trying to seriously grapple with the complexities of public housing delivery. And that we've given that commitment that we are trying to move away from enclaves or high density public towers, and that we are moving to more integrated approaches across density and suburbs. And even that, has difficulty because developers will potentially flag with me that they worry if there is joint developments about the level of public housing in those developments. Uh, and that's a, that's a serious concern too, that in fact people or developers say, you know, if you put too much in, then we won't be able to flog the, the other product. Now, I think that's sad. I'm deeply passionate about public housing. Public housing is the most transformational experience for people, to provide them a roof over their head, to give that security, to give them an opportunity to look at their lives, to focus, to, to be able to perhaps go into training and education because they don't have to worry about a roof on their head. So I am a passionate advocate, and this is a priority, of public housing, but in our first term, we did have to make some difficult decisions. I also want to address the fact uh, the member for North West asserted that in the gas goin there had been no construction. And actually, I'm advised that in the five years in the gas goin we completed 38 houses, including 18 social houses in the gas goin region and 20 key worker. And additionally, we've purchased another seven houses in this area. So I did want to cor correct some, some of the statements. I did want to correct some of the statements that had been made on the public record by the opposition. I also want to talk about the, the broader, the broader uh, picture. 
And that is, we are in extraordinary times. That is the one thing that I can agree with the member for Rowe. And I think he did acknowledge that. That we have seen COVID hit. And of course, we first of all brought in the moratorium. And that moratorium we were actually criticised for, if you remember. But I think it was the right policy decision. We were criticised by landlords. And this is the other complexity of housing policy, is, is that that moratorium provided certainty for, for renters. But, of course, some landlords said, look, we're mums and dad investors, we're facing negative equity, that's putting off increases. So once the moratorium lifted, it was always natural that we would see a correction, a correction in prices. But what we're also seeing is an extraordinary increase in housing supply. And I note none of the opposition acknowledged this. There was no referral to the stats relating to housing supply. And this is a picture that is very critical, that we have had 27,000 building approvals in the last financial year. So we're told there's no plan, there's been no plan at all, except there was an economic stimulus plan, there was a deliberate plan to boost the construction industry because of the fears of a, of a, of a post-recovery in a pandemic environment. And that actually had significant impact. Uh, and in the regions too, which is ignored again by the, by the opposition, they don't refer to the statistics at all, but extraordinary figures in the opposition about the increases. You know, around 4,000 new home building approvals in the regions, uh, around 118% increase. You know, Albany, 137% increase. And the list goes on and on and on. We've seen extraordinary growth in building approvals uh, in the regions. On top of that, we've had our Key Start loan. And Key Start is a proud Labor program that is about giving first time owners a, a chance. And we've seen 4,000 approvals which is a significant growth, uh, which we haven't seen for a long time. So 27,000 building approvals, uh, 4,000 key start loans. These are extraordinary figures. And as we saw in the West Australian this week, many of those are first home buyers. So for the first time in their lives, West Australians are grasping at the opportunity, thanks to the state bonus grant, also the federal government grant, and are seizing it. And I'll read from the West. The year of the first home buyer, first home owner frenzy, as 71 houses selling in, each, in WA each day. The past 12 months have shaped up as the year of the first home buyer, with remarkable figures re revealing more than 100 people joined the property ladder in WA every single day. Now, that is something that is fantastic, that does show an incredible growth of affordable homes uh, and, that, and that that is going to provide relief. And that relief, as I've already stated, is not being projected by this state government. That has been by the very credible Bank West Curtin Economic Centre. They came out with a report that clearly stipulated that because of this huge building growth approval, this huge building growth approval, there will be around or estimated 10,000 homes coming back onto the rental market. And that's because, for the obvious reason, that people will leave their homes, will leave their homes and go into new homes. And we're starting to see that come through. And that is good news uh, for Western Australia. Now, we are very cognisant of the fact of the other challenges because of the COVID pandemic uh, and a booming economy and being a safe place to live. Uh, and that is, with the borders, is obviously that we are facing skill shortages. Uh, and the Premier has had a, a skills summit and a number of new measures. Some are very small, but are really tailored down to even like the fact of looking at driver's licenses for 
uh, apprentices who may have fallen out of the system. These, some of these are really good ideas that actually will help get people back into, uh, into the labour market to assist with delivery of both public homes uh, and both the private market. Now, we've also, as part of that, we ran last year under the Minister for Training, uh, also uh, quick short-term courses in relation to bricklaying, because that was a, obviously a clear need. Uh, and we will continue to look at what other measures into the future that we can do to deal with that skill shortage. But that is a reality. And I have to say this, I would rather face this scenario than what was potentially predicted uh, when COVID first hit. And there were some quite dire projections about the state of the economy. And in fact, we are in different circumstances. We have the strongest economy in Australia. We are a safe haven. People want to come back here. And that's related even with the migration figures, uh, where we saw that the ABS released their data that showed 1,639 more people moved to WA than left for interstate destinations in three months to March, the most single quarter since 2013. Whereas we actually saw others having an exodus. So we are in these extraordinary circumstances and I would rather still be trying to meet the challenges we face than the alternative, which could have been an economic recession, which is what some in, uh, economists had predicted. Now, as a state government, we brought in the building bonus grant. We also brought in the $116 million regional land booster program, which is about providing discounted land in the regions. And there are currently 7,000, uh, 7, I shouldn't say 7,000, 700 lots uh, available, I'm advised, in the market. We also have the three ministers, the Minister for Lands, the Minister uh, for Planning and myself, that are working together as part of a subcommittee uh, the Residential Land and Lands Supply Committee that is looking uh, at how we can further tackle those issues that have been described in the regions and that I'm acutely aware of, and whether it is potentially using future land uh, or other measures. And I am meeting, for example, we are meeting in the future with the Alliance of Major Regional uh, Councils. Now, we are also making a significant investment nearly $1 billion in public housing, social housing, affordable homes, uh, and the homelessness initiatives. That includes $319 million for the SHERP, which is part of the COVID recovery program. Now, like everyone, we are meeting challenges uh, of securing contractors uh, because it is a heated construction market. And I've been on the public record uh, for that. But there is a, a very strong and genuine funding commitment there. The homelessness field, we have seen significant and real investments, nearly $100 million a year in homelessness services. We've had significant new investments. We are building two common ground facilities which provide wraparound services. We opened last week the 100-bed Aboriginal-controlled homeless transition facility in the city. We are uh, opening a medical respite centre for rough sleepers coming out of the public, uh, coming out of hospitals who may be experiencing homelessness. Now, these are all real and tangible and meaningful and will change people's lives. And the member for Cottesloe said, oh, it's just a plan and a plan and a plan. Well, that's not the case at all. There is real money and it's all part of the housing first approach. That's an approach which the previous government didn't do. The previous government did have an ad hoc approach. And our approach is the housing first is simple. At its heart is about saying, that we need to help people get off the streets. They may face serious mental health, drugs and alcohol addictions, but we get them into supported accommodation with intensive wraparound services. 
And what's critical, why that's different from the old model is because previous we used to have high barriers. So people couldn't even get off the street. Or once they got off the street into the accommodation, they fell out of the system. Uh, and so this is the common ground facilities and the housing first a program is actually about providing intensive wraparound services, including on site, to make sure people don't fall out of those houses. And this model has been done around the world. And it has been successful. And for example, in Melbourne, which were far ahead of us, uh, have demonstrated that people have sustained and been sustained. They've had quite some extraordinary figures. Now, the previous government could have adopted the housing first approach. They didn't. They just did bits here and there. I notice they keep quoting figures which actually relate back to their time in the last ABS statistics. The 9,000, uh, the 1,600 were actually from the 2016 uh, figures. But I'm actually really proud of the government that we've taken an evidence-based approach uh, and that now we're applying that as part of the housing first approach in all those significant investments and not just in the city but also in Geraldton and Bunbury. On top of that, we've made new commitments for Indigenous supported accommodation. Uh, that includes Geraldton and the city. Now, what's significant about this, it is obviously uh, in the city areas, uh, people can be coming in for cultural reasons, they could be coming for health services, but, uh, and sometimes those people may uh, be sleeping with relatives or, or perhaps uh, out and about. And what we want to do is provide culturally appropriate accommodation that again provides a support service. Uh, that's Aboriginal supported accommodation, and we're going to be doing one in Geraldton uh, and one in the city. Uh, and uh, I believe the tender is out uh, for Geraldton. So there is, you can see significant rolling investment in the homelessness field uh, and in also uh, public and social housing. But to come back to the complexities, and I just, about the delivery, this one is in my own electorate, and it does demonstrate again, I just, I come back to this, the nuances, was that I was door knocking uh, in a public housing complex in Perth. And there's about 14 in there. And I was getting a number of complaints from some of the public housing tenants. And sadly, those complaints was about a tenant who was under the Housing First program. So it shows you again the complexity of the fact that we got someone off the street, provided support, they were put into a public housing system, and yet other tenants were demanding that uh, tenant be evicted from public housing. Now, as a government, and this is also, we don't want to see evictions. We don't want to see evictions. We want to do every supportive measure that we can have in place to help people stay within the public system. And contrary to some of the reports by advocacy groups, the evictions prior to COVID and post COVID are relatively the same. And that's why we have the $58 million Thrive Program, uh, which is about providing that support for uh, tenants, that support for tenants so that they can stay uh, in the system. Now, the other challenges that we have faced, and the, I think the member for Roe mentioned it, was about maintenance. Uh, now, I am going to be looking to the future about how we can get better bang for buck in terms of maintenance. Of course, I want us to always be able to do better. But we did face a major challenge in the Midwest in coming as a new minister to deal with uh, the collapse of, of Pindan. And that was a serious issue for me because had we decided, and I say this respectfully, but had we decided to terminate that contract, what would have happened overnight was priority one and priority two, two jobs would have stopped on those social housing maintenance. It would have stopped. And then we would have had people at risk in that public housing. Yeah. 
land. So housing were directly employing uh, those subcontractors to do the work. I'm advised it was through uh, the through the Pindan when the contract negotiations continued. So the point I'm making, member, and I say this sincerely, if we had terminated it, you would not have seen the outcome that you would have seen today. And it is fair to say, uh, and I appreciate you had your politics to make, but by holding steadfast, by working through with EY, that we delivered the best outcome for Midwest because we were able to maintain services to those properties for critical jobs. We were talking at you know critical risk jobs to tenants, uh, but also that we were able to keep 90 people in jobs that perhaps otherwise wouldn't have been maintained had we just terminated because there would have been no potential sale to program to see the continuation of that staff. And I do want to say this, Member for North West, I have had positive approaches and I'm going to ring, read one out for the public record right now. Good morning, John. I wanted to personally thank you for your unwavering support recently for Pindan Asset Management continuation of the Housing Authority Head Maintenance contract under licence agreement with Program. I know this was a very difficult situation for you and your integral support has now secured almost 100 PAM jobs. I can assure you all the personnel of PAM are extremely grateful. I look forward to meeting uh, you soon and thanking you in person. Now, I didn't ask for that. That was just sent to me. And that does demonstrate that I understand the politics where we want theatrics, we want to get headlines in the paper, but that prudent approach that I took, the measured approach, actually, I do think, provided the best outcome. It provided the best outcome for regional jobs. It provided the best outcome for services for maintenance of, of public housing properties. And I think that is the general assessment by the community. Yes. I am serious. I am serious on this. Dan's situation was, and it's now come to light that there's, there's more evidence that perhaps it was known before that they were in trouble. And the real issue around the Pindan situation was that it was a government contract and the government, which you're a part of, um, said that they will uh, legislate to protect subcontractors. That's the issue uh, that has, has come about this, is where the legislation doesn't protect those who have lost money. I think that's that's the issue and that's the point that I was coming from, is that you promised legislation, it wasn't delivered, and we had that situation with Pindan and now we've got another company in the same boat. But North West Central, it is on the public record repeatedly, and it's fair to say, because you yelled it across the chamber, terminate, terminate, terminate. And if I'd taken that approach, there is general agreement in the community, in your own community, that it would have resulted in the loss of 90 jobs. Now, is anyone saying that I made the wrong course of action in sticking forth, being measured, not reacting to the politics, seeing that through with the negotiations, uh, obviously not personally, but the department to persist, that I think we got the best outcome? I absolutely understand the plight of contractors. Yeah, but under your... Member for North West, under your scenario, there would have been no outcome because they would have lost their jobs, there would have been no sale of program and no benefit for creditors. Your outcome painted the worst scenario for people. No, your outcome painted the worst scenario. If I'd listened to your advice and your politicking, it would have generated the worst scenario. I don't understand how you can still argue against the saving and retention of 90 jobs, including in retentions. In retention. He continues to persist. Minister there is a clear line. Minister there is a clear line. Minister for Housing, would you... 
preferred not to have the interjection? I'm, yeah, I'm fine without interjections. Okay. So. <laughs> Go on, Minister. Um, so, it is very clear, it is very clear that we made the right decision on this, uh, that it was a prudent approach, and I stand by that decision, and it is clear that the workers affected, directly affected, agree that it was the best outcome and that we projected jobs in the regions. <laughs> and, you know, I am uh, very cognisant that that was the right uh, direction. In terms of future uh, policy, of course, uh, I'm working through the budget process, but I have been looking at particular issues and trends. Obviously, the opposition raises vacant houses. Again, I have been looking at the churn rate for vacant houses, but I want to be very clear. The opposition is misleading again, because there is always going to be a percentage of houses in the public system that are vacant. And this makes sense. Someone says, I want to leave the public housing system. Then that property becomes vacant. There has to be refurbishment works undertaken. So this is actually entirely normal. Now, as the minister, I'm working through ways to accelerate that, so the churn rate. But what the other factor that the opposition just ignores is, is that we also need to do significant investment in refurbishment. That this idea that uh, if you go to some of the vacant properties, and you know, I put these policy, I put this out in the public arena, but there has to be significant investment, uh, which does vary, but there is significant investment uh, across the board in terms of maintenance and refurbishment of properties as part of that churn. So we are working through about how we can, how we can better uh, get through that churn rate. But to suggest that there is ever going to be no vacancies in the public housing system is just simply nonsense. It's just, it is actually dishonest and fails to recognise that churn, um, that churn rate. I am also looking as I've said on the public record, in terms of modular homes. I understand that we have a very strong construction market and accordingly, I am looking at, and the agency is looking at, modular and how we can use that to get accelerating house, public housing delivery or grow housing, uh, we, and particularly looking at regional areas because it's an obvious fit and that it's a way potentially of growing the sector, growing the industry, creating jobs in those areas, but also adding to the overall public uh, and social housing stock. So overall, I want to say this. We do have a very strong investment program, nearly $1 billion. Our building bonus grant has delivered for West Australians. It's been extraordinary, 27,000 building approvals. That will create private rental relief across, across Western Australia. We've seen extraordinary building approvals in the regions. All those homes will provide relief uh, to the regions. We've seen 4,000 key start, again, huge numbers of first home buyers for the first time uh, entering the market. We have the billion dollar, nearly billion dollar our program. We're investing $100 million in homelessness initiatives. We've got new initiatives that we opened last week and the two common ground facilities as part of the Housing First approach. So what we're seeing is a very significant investment, but also being upfront with the community about the complexities of public housing delivery, how we want to move to a more integrated approach across suburbs and towns, because that will deliver better social outcomes, that we have had to make some tough decisions in relating to high density, um, high density social areas, but we are strongly committed to public housing in Western Australia, but we want to do it a better way that delivers better outcomes for all West Australians, and that is our strong commitment.
Leader of the Opposition. King Speaker. Um, thank you, Minister, um, for your response to this motion. Um, and I actually think, from an opposition perspective, uh, the motion that's been brought to the House by the member for North West Central um, in relation to the matters that have been canvassed by members that have already spoken and what we'll just follow up on, on your contribution is very timely, is very timely. And I think the, the Minister for Health has been given a reprieve this Wednesday night um, because we've seen a significant amount of funds announced. Um, we're, let, we're yet to see the detail um, in relation to timing and, and how that will actually be rolled out. But this is a crisis of a similar scale in another portfolio that has come about under the watch of this government. And this government likes to uh, refer to the previous Liberal National Government. But this is their... F they've been in power for four and a half years. Four and a half years. And so it is, it is time to own the fact that decisions that were made in the first term of this government are now coming home to roost. They are now coming home to roost. And the people of Western Australia are, are the ones that are suffering for it. So the Minister for uh, Housing and I've, I've been in that position. I've stood on, on that side of the chamber and I've had to respond to private members' businesses, uh, private members business and, and MPIs and suspension of standing orders uh, in my own portfolio areas. And, um, and you do try to reasonably roll out um, the, the reasons why it is difficult to provide a, a response that the community desires and to, to assist in uh, actually <laughs> providing basic government services. It, it is difficult um, to do this in government. There are many moving parts. And I think all of these members here acknowledge that. None of us came into this House and said this is a simplistic problem. I know the Minister said that, but that's not actually what we came into the House and said. We acknowledge that it's, uh, it requires a whole of government response. It, it requires uh, a complex mix of uh, departments and also the private sector. Um, and, and certainly, Whilst everything that the minister said seemed sensible, it's not going to provide any comfort to those uh, many, many people that are already sleeping rough or without a fixed address or find themselves at risk of becoming homeless and the stress and the pressure that that puts not only on the individual, their family, but then all of the other government services that come into play and the community organisations. And all I can say is that this has come about because of the lack of investment, the lack of planning, the lack of prioritisation in this, in this sector by this government, by this government, four and a half years in. We cannot keep hearing ministers come to this place and say that this is something that uh, can be sheeted home to the previous government. And it was interesting, um, just from a local perspective, when the Minister for Housing raised the issue around um, the sale of assets in the wheat belt, because one of the reasons that the Minister for Housing has given uh, that they've started selling off houses and they haven't been able to replace them, and so we're in this deficit, um, is because they want to have a different mix of housing uh, in communities across the state. Now, I know, because I was personally involved in some of these issues in the wheat belt, that, for instance, this, the, the community of Gamaling, which is just outside Northam, actually um, back in the time that the minister was referring to, was one of the towns, if not the town, with the highest proportion of public housing in this community. Now, this is not somewhere that has wraparound services. It doesn't have access to public transport. There are no uh, Centrelink offices within Kui. There's no way for you, if you are a family with um, serious needs or complex needs to be addressed uh, for, for you to actually access any of that. And yet they had the highest proportion in terms of their population of public housing. And so, yes, there were moves, particularly from a wheat belt perspective, and I, um, I, I'm aware of them because I was working with the then Minister for Housing, uh, the Honourable Colin Holt, and prior to that, uh, the, Terry Redman, uh, to try and address some of those concerns. So this is not a new issue. It's not a new issue, but there was a plan at the time to actually invest, and, and that investment did occur. We invested significantly in public housing um, into areas in regional centres, and I'm talking from a regional perspective um, and certainly from my, uh, from my electorate's perspective at this stage, 
into regional service centres where these services were available because I can't tell you the number of times that people turned up into my office, either in Meriden or Northam, and um, had through sheer desperation taken a house in either Hyden or Muck and Wooden or Gamaling or Wild Catcham. And whilst those communities are amazing places to live and the community will provide you an enormous amount of support, they do not if they are if they are complex families or, or families or individuals with complex needs, they are not going to be able to access the services that they require in some of those smaller communities. But that percentage in Gamaling in particular, and it sticks in my mind because I went to many, many meetings, I, I, I sympathise with what the, what the minister is trying to do. But what we did was actually reinvest and, and we did have a significant um, housing program right across the continuum right across the continuum, not just in public housing, in community housing, in workers' accommodation, as the member for North West Central raised, um, in grow housing, the, the member for Row raised uh, issues in terms of grow housing. 217 houses, I think you said. That was in response to a question that was asked in the Legislative Council. And worryingly, the, the, the departments that are in most need of these um, houses are the Department of Police and the Department of Education. Um, another issue that the Minister for Housing raised was um, you know, working with the community to try and address some of these issues. And I know from my own experience in my own electorate, and I know other members have had it too, is that there's an extraordinary amount of pressure from the Department of Housing on our local governments to be the, the provider of this housing. The Department of Housing has ceased um, through the GROW program to build its own houses. It relies on local governments to fill that gap. Now that's okay if you're a uh, well, it's, it's probably not okay. That's a, a, a generalisation. If you've got the capacity to fund that, um, like the city of Caratha or maybe some of our bigger regional centres with bigger rate bases, well, perhaps that's something that you can fit into your local government budget. But if you are the Shire of Wilcatcham or you are the Shire of Narrambeen or any of those smaller communities and the Department of Housing comes to you and says, uh, we've got a proposition for you, build us a grow house, we'll give you a contract, uh, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because they know that if they don't agree to it, then the potential for them to secure that next police officer or that next education um, uh, individual, whether it's a, a teacher or the next principal that they need, will be at risk. And I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right that our communities are actually now um, being looked at as providing a solution to a problem that, uh, whether it's compounded over many years, it's come to bear right now, four and a half years into this government's tenure, and we see so many of our communities fronting up and stepping up ratepayers' dollars uh, because they are fearful that they won't be able to attract and retain those workers that they so desperately need um, so that their kids can get a decent education, so their hospital does have a nurse, uh, so that they can house a doctor. And, uh, and again, that's something that this, this government needs to attend to. If the minister is truly... Um, is, is truthful in his words that everything's on the table and that he's looking for innovative solutions. Well, I put it on the table right now that some of those smaller councils don't have the ability to continue to do this. And in fact, when you get to the north of the state, the north of the state, when you add the cost of insurance, the development costs of the land, um, it is simply out of the reach of some of these uh, communities to do that. There is, there is no way that you will ever you will ever get back, even with a contract with the Department of Communities or through Grow, to make your money back. Um, and we have local governments faced with that every every day, every day. And uh, and I, I think if the minister is genuine, um, that he will look at that issue as well and and stop using our local governments as uh, an external bank uh, for the government to build houses and actually get on with the job of building them and expanding our housing options in in regional Western Australia in particular for those grow houses. Because 217, whether it might be a wish list or not, I can promise you that there are houses right throughout regional Western Australia that are in desperate need of refurbishment. And uh, uh, having spoken recently to a number of police officers in uh, my own electorate, um, none, of them, none of them will complain publicly, but they all know where the good houses are in the state. And they will all, it's the first question you ask, 
when you're uh, being recruited or, or asked to move to another place uh, in regional west of Australia is what's the housing like? Am I bringing my family into something that was built in 1972 and hasn't seen an upgrade since then? Or is it something that's been built maybe in 2010 and it's looking pretty good? Because in some of these communities, um, that, is, that is one of the major attraction pieces uh, for retaining a workforce, absolutely. And, uh, and you only need to talk to those staff to understand just how important it is. And if we want to talk about records in government, when we came to government in 2008, one of our first programs of investment back into regional Western Australia after years of neglect <laughs> after the previous Labor government uh, was to actually do just that, is to go through the grow housing uh, stock and make sure that we either refurbished, rebuilt or added to that housing stock. Now, the difficulty at the time, and I think it still exists, is that the, the Department of Housing manages its own, um, its own uh, housing stock and the funding that we were providing went through um, the Department of Housing and so there was a, a whole raft of health housing that didn't get that investment. But I can tell you there was investment to uh, police and teachers in particular and other key service workers right across the state as a result of our focus uh, in government on making sure that uh, workers during in key areas during, during a boom, and that's right, Member for North West Central. 2010, uh, the Minister was talking about 2010. Um, 2010, at the peak of the construction boom, peak of the construction boom where we saw almost the population of Tasmania move to Western Australia, um, we didn't have at that point a booming royalty rate. In fact, it was one of the lowest rates that we'd ever seen in the state. We had the major mining companies in a race to the bottom to get their costs uh, right down. And we had uh, calls on every construction worker that you could get your hand on. So it was a very difficult environment to work within. Uh, there was certainly no solution to the GST on the table at that point in time. So our circumstances at that time were that we invested even within those constrained circumstances, because we knew that we would be constraining future growth of our state if we didn't make that investment. Now, that's one part of the housing continuum, one part of the housing continuum, but it is very, very important. That workers' accommodation part of the, uh, the continuum, again, very important. And another, uh, you know, a, a funding stream that was made available and possible by royalties for regions, because at the time, it was, it, there had been such a neglect of opening up of land to allow for that development that there was no way to kickstart um, or to get that work done in time to accommodate those workers and to retain all the businesses and those service workers that make a community a community uh, in places like Caratha and Port Hedland and Exmouth. And, uh, and so there might be criticism in relation to those workers' accommodation uh, projects run under the previous government, but I tell you what, they're all full. They're all full, and every community we go to says, can we have another one? Can we have another one? Build us some more. Build us some more. Because we need to be able to retain when that pressure comes on and, and our state is uh, subject to those swings from a mining sector perspective, we need to be able to maintain those businesses that are the heart and soul of our communities uh, to make sure that we have the hairdressers and the butchers and the people that work in the coffee shops uh, and also all of our, our key critical workers um, in our, in our uh, government services and in places in the north of the state, that is incredibly difficult. That is incredibly difficult without some sort of intervention from the state government. And that is the role of the state government, without a doubt. Partner with the private sector, use their expertise, um, and, and certainly don't shy away from that. Because at this point, if the minister's genuine in his, his statements that everything's on the table and we're looking to try and address these problems, thinking outside the square, well, don't discount things that have been done by previous governments out of sheer bloody-mindedness. Um, don't look back and say, we're not going to do that. Uh, we don't want to go any ne anywhere near it because the previous government did that. We'll come up with our own solution. Um, we'll cheer you on because every one of our communities is saying, please, please. We need the assistance. We need the assistance. So that housing continuum, when you talk about workers' accommodation, and, and it's not just restricted to the northwest. So we, we had conversations like this in the Midwest the other day uh, with the member for Moore. Um, significant uh, roadworks with federal and, and state funding going into major projects through that area. There's a number of mining projects in the Midwest uh, that are drawing um, drawing. Uh, workers from all over the place. I know, for example, 2J, Mora, um, and Dan Darrigan, communities in and around that Midwest uh, are at capacity. There's not a rental to be had. 
not a rental to be had. And yet you've got businesses like Agrifresh and Mora Citrus um, and the Northern Valley Packers who are, from, from an agricultural perspective, cutting edge in terms of the technology they're employing, the quality of the produce that they're um, make, uh, producing for the domestic and, and export market, and yet they, they, cannot, they can't find places for their workers. They can't find places for their workers. So this, uh, this lack of joined up thinking in terms of uh, land release, in terms of uh, looking at how we can mitigate some of the costs of developing land in regional communities because of the cost of connecting power and water, um, which is a disincentive for local governments to do it. And quite frankly, I don't think it should be left to them, but history says that that's exactly what happens in these smaller communities where the market doesn't work. Um, that's the kind of joined up uh, forward thinking that we want this minister to be to be ad addressing, um, and of course, then you get to the very vulnerable end, the very vulnerable end of uh, of the the, the um, of the of the housing issue, and that's been canvassed very well in this in this place um, on a number of occasions. And I did ask a question of the the minister for communities, the minister, sorry. The Minister for Communities today in relation to a housing support question, uh, housing support service. And I acknowledge that it was, for, and, and the Minister was quite right, the Minister for Communities pointed out that this program um, was funded, previously funded by the, um, by the federal government. Four years of Commonwealth funding, four years of Commonwealth funding for what is essentially a state government program. Um, and, and housing support, you would argue, every day of the week, because the, the, the minister went on and actually explained what was being invested in other programs. Um, so it clearly sits with the state government as a responsibility. But um, this, this program has, uh, has been funded at a million dollars a year since 2017, since 2017. And unfortunately, um, that funding has, has come to an end. And what this, what, what the, uh, the proponents of the project have asked is that the Minister for Communities consider $50,000 a year, $50,000 a year, in a, in a state with a $5 billion surplus, a state with a $5 billion surplus. Um, the information that we have is that they've helped keep uh, more than 1,500 children off the streets and, keep, and, and kept at-risk vulnerable Aboriginal families together. Um, it was uh, launched as a volunteer organisation. May I have an extension, please? Um, and their staff includes um, psychosocial counsellors, social workers, health practi practitioners, mentors to help resolve issues um, in dealing with both the Department of Housing and the Department of Communities. So it is regrettable that the federal government has not sought to renew that, but I think there's an opportunity for the state to step in. And for $50,000 a year, $50,000 a year, you would have the endorsement of um, uh, very well-known and respected uh, community members here in WA who have significant expertise in the man uh, in children's wellbeing and services, Dr Fiona Stanley. Um, the program manages uh, that the state government funds uh, Outcare, uh, their program Thrive. They say they use, they use the program, they use the services that are provided um, by this First Nations homelessness project. And so they would see it as, as something that was hugely beneficial for it to be funded. And yet the minister, um, and, and she agreed that it was a good project, but she said, there is no funding for this. There is no funding for this from the state government. Um, Fiona Stanley, as I said, um, was reported at the time that the funding was coming to an end, was reported to have directly intervened and actually written to the Minister for Communities um, to, to ask her to save the program, um, saying that there's no comparable service, no comparable service. And I quote, it is successful because it assesses each family and wraps around them the support and services they need to survive. Um, her last quote in that article was supporting people to stay in their home and helping them to manage their budgets, health and social issues um, prevents later costly problems, costly for the people concerned and costly for government services. Now, if we've got a housing problem and we've already got people in homes and there's a program for $50,000 a year to support people to stay in their homes so the Minister for Housing doesn't have to build additional homes, wouldn't you think that that would be a no-brainer? But instead, the minister chose to play politics uh, and do the finger pointing when she had an opportunity to really step up and say, yes, that's something that I'll reconsider. Yeah. $5 billion. Yeah. $5 billion in the state budget. Surplus. 
we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we reach out and we'll have that conversation again. Help prevent the evictions that result in homelessness. Help prevent some of that crisis that we are seeing uh, burgeoning onto our streets in every community in Western Australia. And I know it'll be cold comfort for the team at First Nations Homelessness Project, but I've had the exact same conversation with the Minister for Communities about local housing support projects. And this is what I don't understand, because I've raised in this place on a number of occasions and directly with the Minister, the Avon Community Services Program. Uh, again, a program to support young people in the wheat belt, um, to uh, put a roof over their head and give them some life skills to get them back on track and into sustainable and stable housing. I would have thought that that would be right up the Minister's alley, right up the Minister's alley. But again, uh, on every request, we don't have funding in the budget for that. We don't have funding in the budget for that. And I wonder, I just wonder, I wonder why we aren't putting everything on the table when it comes to keeping people in the homes that they've got. Avon Community Services has a home. They have a home to look after these young people that just need a helping hand. Uh, the alternative is, is that they are homeless or street present or they're couch surfing through our communities. And this is only one, one in Northern for the entire of the wheat belt. Uh, and yet we can get no traction and yet we can get no traction. So uh, I think from, from our perspective, a, a very disappointing, um, a very disappointing uh, response from the minister in relation to that particular issue that was raised today. Uh, and I do urge the minister to reconsider and I do urge her to reach out and have that conversation again. And surely, surely in a state with a $5 billion projected surplus, we can find $50,000 a year uh, to support to support the work that this community does. And don't take our word for it. There are, there are many eminent people that actually um, that have, have actually supported that. Uh, and I, I'm happy, you know, I've gone on record, it is regrettable that the federal government have um, ceased to fund this. But I look at it as you got four years of Commonwealth funding when really it probably should have been a state government funded program. And, uh, and you can, well, it's a housing support program. So, you know, you fund housing support programs at a state level. There's four years that have been provided by the state, at the, the federal government at $1 million. They're asking for 50000 I don't think it's an unreasonable request. So that housing continuum um, uh, continues, uh, continues to, to fail the people of, of Western Australia, failed on every front. And we cannot get the minister, um, like, what, like we couldn't get the minister for health to say the word crisis. Six, six little letters will not acknowledge the fact that we are at crisis levels will not acknowledge the fact that, there, that we are at crisis levels in terms of um, the fact that we have a, a lack of public housing across the board as a result of their failure to invest and selling off properties. We don't have options for workers uh, that are desperately needed in our regions, not least of which in, in, the, uh, in, in Kalbarri and Northampton and across that Midwest area. Um, that is something that needs urgent, urgent attention. Um, we don't have solutions for our grow housing, uh, and I don't see a program of refurbishment for some of those very run-down, uh, very run-down government-owned facilities. And I certainly would welcome the minister's um, commentary, either in this place or or offline, as to how we might try and stem those requests to local governments to become the bank for the state government to build houses to attract and retain um, nurses, teachers, police, and the like. Because uh, that is the feedback that I get as I travel across the state, and it's it's simply not good enough. Um, uh, I, oh, the minister for mm, better not do that. He's about to walk out of the chamber <laughs> on urgent. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. I won't go there. Um, it people's. It, you know, we've we've seen um, the hugely tragic circumstance of people losing their lives. Um, we've had a, a on the streets on the streets because they haven't had the support that they need um, on the steps of Parliament House last week. Uh, a number of sleeping bags laid out on the steps to demonstrate the number of people that have lost their lives as a result of uh, uh, exposure or um, succumbing to the, the, the myriad of complex issues that they face um, by being street present, homeless, um, unable to access the services that they deserve. And uh, the first thing that the government should do is admit that there's a crisis. They should admit that there's a crisis. And then they should get on with doing what they've managed to do after consistent pressure from uh, 
the unions, from the workforce, from the media, from the opposition in relation to the health crisis that we are experiencing, again, of this government's own making, and come up with a package that comprehensively deals with all of those issues and brings all of the government agencies together all of the government agency, agencies together. And that goes to the issue that the member for North West Central was talking about when you're dealing with people under pressure, uh, like the CEO in the, the Shire of Northampton. Um, and, and understanding that you need to have the government's um, firepower sitting behind you to support you to come up with these solutions and to, to wrap around you. It is too much to expect someone in that position to manage that and deal with multiple agencies, multiple departments. And whilst um, the government may say that there's been a coordinator appointed, I can promise you that as, a, as, as the CEO in a position, um, it is unrelenting in situations like that. And so we just need to be a little bit careful because those issues will change. Those issues will change and new ones will emerge. New ones will emerge. But if we can't get appropriate housing, if we can't get appropriate support services and we can't actually work with the people who are elected and um, very well supported in their community, then we are going to fail those communities. We are going to fail those communities. And, uh, and that is our great fear. That is our great fear. So, Minister, um, I, I thoroughly support the motion that's been brought to the House uh, today by the member for North West Central. Um, I note on the notice paper that um, the title was um, public housing, but the motion actually um, condemned the Labor government for its failure to prioritise housing in the last five years of government, creating a housing crisis the state has never seen before, triggering significant economic and social consequences. I think all members have uh, touched on areas in their own electorates, but across that housing continuum that we talk about. and. Uh, and we really, we really urge this government to make sure that in this upcoming budget there is an appropriate response so that we aren't having this conversation uh, in another six months' time, 12 months' time. Um, there needs to be a plan. We need to understand what that plan is. The private sector should be engaged. Um, we should be including them in the conversations about how we might best solve some of these wicked problems. And, uh, and certainly I'd have thought that the minister would be in attendance at the, uh, the forum that was held the other day. Um, it was disappointing. I don't think there was. Um, uh, I don't think there was an answer to the question as to whether or not any of your ministerial colleagues or other colleagues were in attendance at that meeting. Um, I understand that there was a, a departmental, uh, a, a department representative there. But these were some of the peak bodies in the sector. Um, and I would have thought that, given the severity of the situation that we face here in Western Australia, that we would have had someone from the government sitting and paying respect to those that are on the front line. Uh, dealing with these, dealing with these issues. Uh, Minister, Minister, do you agree with that assessment? I, do you want me to answer that question? Yeah, do you think we've yeah been I bullying? absolutely do. Oh, and do you know what? Do you know, because I get that feedback from community that groups. Is so, so constructive criticism. That so is constructive. That is don't like the answer, do you? <laughs> members, would you members, like me to? Would you like me to continue the answer? Let the leader. You asked me the question, Minister. You asked me the question. I hear feedback from people that would. The minister asked me a direct question. You've just walked into the chamber and have absolutely no idea what we're talking about, Minister for Police. As per usual, as per usual, you've got no idea. You just chime in with some inane comment. Minister, you asked me a genuine question, and I'm telling you that there are people within who would consider themselves friends of the Labor Party that when they provide constructive criticism to a number of ministers, and there are some that are not in the chamber at the moment, that they, if they don't and aren't seen to be agreeing with the agenda and the priorities of this government, they are then blocked out of the conversation and are in fact told that things will get very, very difficult for them. So whether that's you or whether that's someone else sitting around your cabinet table, I tell you what, I've heard it more than once. I've heard it more than once. And you don't want to get like that because arrogant governments lose government. Arrogant love, they lose government. Because that is the word on the street. That is the word on the street. Word on the street is that your government, if you don't agree with them, you will not be welcome in those ministers' ministers' offices. You will not be welcome in those ministers' offices. Well, you asked the question. Uh, you asked the question. I gave. I'm hardly going to list the people. The people I don't think so, Minister.
Lester. I don't think so. And actually, I wasn't directing the question at you. I wasn't directing the comments at you, Minister, but your indignation makes me think that perhaps there is something to hide. Anyway, you invited you invited the assessment, and yes, I absolutely endorse I absolutely endorse the comments from the Minister for North West Central. You shouldn't have asked the question if you didn't like the answer, Minister. This, in, this entire sector, this entire sector is in crisis, Thank you. Minister. Thank you. It is in Member. crisis and it's come about under your watch. Under your watch. Four and a half years. Member. Four and a half years and we find Minister. ourselves... Minister, 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 that's enough. Four and a half years and we find ourselves in a dire situation dire situation, not only in health, but in housing and accommodation right Thank across you. this state. Oh, first time in five years. Member for, what, member for first Wanneroo. First time in five years. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. Uh, thank you, I wish I had more than five minutes. And since the member for, for North West Central has tried up, I've got a lot to say. Thank you, North West Central. I've got a lot to say, but I think I'll do him first, if that's all right. I'll do you first before I need to correct. I need to correct. I need to correct the record before when I interjected and suggested that you actually lost the booth of Exmouth. I was incorrect. You actually won that booth. Well done, member. But I just want to also add for the House that you lost the, the booth of Kalbarri, the booth of Mekathara, the booth of Onslow, the booth of Panawanica, the booth of Parabadu, and the booth of Tom Price. In fact, the Labor can. In fact, yeah, it was one of Scott Morrison's miracles. Go ahead. The National Party did. I think the members misleading uh, uh, the people in this chamber. Thank you, members. Um, That's not a point of the order. Member Continue North on, West Member Central, Central, and everybody well knows that he lost that election on a primary count. You have to have a seat for your member for Wanneroo for a second. Uh, sorry, yeah. no. Wanneroo um, clearly is not speaking to the motion that's uh, <laughs> before the House. There is no Can you ask her yeah. to Thank you, member get for back Northwest. to the actual motion? There is no point Relevance. of order. Stan, go again, member Thank you. I'm sorry. I had to do you first since you interject straight away. But uh, I've only got five minutes left and I wanted to just uh, uh, highlight a couple of um, arguments that seem to keep coming up in the opposition whenever they jump up, whether we're talking about health, whether we're talking about housing. Um, next, I suppose, crime will come up as a the theme. Um, on the one hand, there are great pain, pains to remind us all that the only reason that many of us are here is because of COVID. The election was all about COVID. We never won because of any of our policies or any of the work we did in the last four years. You only got here because of COVID. That, that is all we ever hear. Yet, they don't apply that logic to talking about important issues about health or housing and giving acknowledgement that over 18 months we're in the middle of a pandemic and that somehow you might need to give acknowledgement that those things factor in to the issues around housing or health. You can't have it both ways, members. You, you can't have it both ways and say, we're only here because of COVID, but when we try to acknowledge that COVID is impacting severely on our health system and also the way uh, housing, uh, the housing sector is being impacted, you, you don't actually acknowledge that. Um, there is a skill shortage that is directly because of the COVID pandemic. There is an increased migration to Western Australia that is exactly because of COVID. Now, those two factors do impact on the housing issues that the government is facing. You can't have it both ways, um, members. Now, politics is all about the art of taking credit for other people's work. And I think the member for Cottesloe yesterday, his, his efforts were breathtaking. His suggestion that because of his opposition, his pressure on the health minister, that somehow $1.9 billion was, was, was brought into the health system because of his strong advocacy as an opposition spokesperson. So I reckon, members, they've actually got a cunning plan. I think they're now targeting housing this week because at some time in the future, when they know 
when they know that the work that our, our housing minister is doing will pay dividends, they're going to somehow try and take credit for it as well. Um, I noticed the opposition leader before uh, was suggesting that uh, she, uh, we shouldn't mention the previous government's performance. But members, we do have to do that because, no, not because they're arrogant, but because the punters out there need to make choices between a government and an opposition. So they see you actually as an alternative. So they actually have to compare you. No, no, they don't, but they do have to make a clear choice. And they made that decision. And can I just say, every portfolio that I look at, whenever I'm preparing for, for, for any of the um, you know, issues that the opposition raised, let, let's have a look at housing and how you did when you were previously in government. I'm only going to talk about the people that were in charge. For about 12 months, you had Troy Buswell. Then you went to Bill Marmion for about less than a year. Then you went back to Troy Buswell. This is as a housing minister. Then you went to Terry Redman for less than a year. Then you went back to Bill Marmion. Then you went to Colin Holt. And then we went to Brendan Grills. So none of your ministers in the previous government, when we're talking about the housing portfolios, served more than one year, seven months. That's how much of a priority it was for you. That's how much of a priority it was for you. Now, now, but you tried it. You tried a little. You tried. You tried a little bit harder post 2017 in opposition, where we started with the shadow housing minister Peter Collier for a little while. Then you swung to Sean Lestrange as the housing minister. Then you came up with the idea that the member for Kareen should be the special shadow for homelessness and housing. And and then we had that wonderful you. policy of yours of Thank $268 million for 2,600 homes. In accordance with Standing Order 61, this business is interrupted and adjourned until another day. <laughs> <laughs> um, member <laughs> for the House. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the House be adjourned. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.